I'm just gonna play Brotato. Brotato, Brotato. Boil him, mash him, stick him in a stew. This isn't Bayonetta. You wanna have a conversation with somebody while playing Bayonetta? That seems pretty difficult. Turns on audio. No, you have to squeeze out the cum afterward. The toothpaste method is correct. Yeah, exactly. You know what? I'm not explaining anything about this game to you fucking people. Well, we have to start over, obviously. Is this Flash? Uh, isn't... isn't... Flash get disabled? Flash is dead? That's so fucked up, man. <laughs> I, I hate that so much. I know they saved a lot of stuff that got ported over, yeah, to Java or HTML, but it still sucks. Flashpoint Infinity exists. I know. It's just a childhood thing. We're old Vosh set. Yeah. What? What cat noise is that? I know, Cryomancer cat. The whole debate happened without you. Ah, uh, Sag. How's your pussy? Pigeon is doing just fine. She just wanted to spend time with Vermin. I also like spending time with Vermin. That's why we're good friends. Mm-hmm. Maybe wrestling with the news. It's similar, Lunalux. You don't think this uh you don't think this person would do me a disservice by being late, do you? You don't think they'd do that to me? Get the cute bee? I did not get the cute bee. Yes, I've played 20 minutes until dawn. I got all the achievements as well. And I got all the achievements in Vampire Survivors. Basically, I'm just super good at games. But in the end, it doesn't even... Having a distinct concern this guy's going to be late. Maybe I should have the audio on until they show up, at least. Did you 100% dead cells? No, fuck that. True, Wax Newman, true. Bosh, why don't you acknowledge your bad take? Public transit is a safe space in regards to police and overdose. No, it's... Wait, public transit isn't a safe space for anything. It's public transit. Get to where you're trying to go. We all have a civic responsibility to treat our environment well. Because if we don't do that, then all this shit becomes, like, untenable, man. I think, I think if you ask the average American, like, hey, why don't you use public transportation more? One of the most frequent responses you'll get would be somebody saying, like, um, basically, like, there are a lot of, like, sussy people on there. Like, that would be a really common response, I think. Um, I, I wouldn't blame them for feeling that way. I hate it when people are sussy around me. Wait, is that not true, Canoe? Didn't I? Some people are not choosing their circumstances or what is most survivable them. We are talking about smoking crack on a subway. You can choose to not. I'm, no, I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not buying into this.
Can't believe I was wrong about my fucking Steam achievements for 20 minutes till dawn, and Canoe just went there and double checked me. What a piece of shit. Oh, that's a lucky find. If we had proper mental health services, we'd have less sussy people in general. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah. That's a pretty big part of it. Well, as long as we're waiting, I guess. Why haven't you looked to understand drug use as the same conditions of poverty? Do you also blame people for being poor? This has nothing to do with blaming people for being anything. Don't do that shit on the subway. This is the first debate. Um, the, the, the guy who made the video um, critiquing Kurzgesagt that I went over uh, DM'd me on Twitter and asked if I'd be willing to talk about it, which of course I am, but that was like months ago, but then he finally got back to me, so. I, and not that I mind criticisms of Kurzgesagt. Um, the weird thing was that it seemed like a lot of the criticisms were kind of ephemeral and conspiratorial. The video felt really conspiratorial. It felt like it was mostly just, um, oh, they take money from Bill and Melinda Gates. But the subway is the safest place for them? Support it till there's a better option? No, I don't support it. And I also don't think the subway is the safest place to do crack. I don't buy that. I don't think that's true at all. How is this game so cute? Um, it's satisfying. I've been watching uh, Joseph Anderson play a bunch of his old playthroughs, like Ace Attorney, while playing this, and it's very nice. One of my old, one of the great pleasures is just listening to uh, a, a, a Let's Play that has a heavy audio component while you uh, play a game that doesn't. People are mad at the gay couple in The Last of Us show. I haven't seen it, so I can't really comment on it. I'm going to message this person, howdy, howdy. Howdy, howdy. Alright, I've done all I can. Double howdy? Yeah, double howdy. I'm coming on strong today. Ooh, 9 max HP. Yes, please. And crit chance. Beautiful. Beautiful. They ghosted you? They might have just forgotten. I mean, I've done that to other people as well, so I don't feel like it's... I feel like it's a bit hypocritical of me to get super mad at other people. Um, if that happens to me, you know? Even if it's a bit annoying. Either way, we do have a debate at 9.30, so... I bet they bailed. But they're the one who approached me. Vosh, describe why it's not the safest place for them. Listen, even if it was... So first of all, a subway is not a safe place at all. People get hurt there all the time. So the idea that it's safe is not the case. Also, uh, metro cops are like everywhere. Um, so the idea that it's the safest place to do crack is not true, for one. For two, I don't care even if it was. Uh, even if it was the safest place for them to do crack, I don't care. It's a subway. It's a public utility that exists not for people to do crack, but for people to get moved from one place to another. I don't care if it's like a convenient place to um to do your crack i do not respect their crack journey 
Do we want to up on claw trees here? Fuck, we probably do. Mm, okay. Bosh, homeless people exist publicly inherently. Your argument is bullshit. Center spiral. If you want to do crack on the subway, I'm not telling you that you can't do it, okay? Y you can't do what you want, okay? <laughs> Why? Why are you taking this stand? What is happening? No fun allowed. That's my position. That's my principled ethical socialist position. Not even to mention the safety of other people, man. Like, people who do crack on the subway aren't the most stable people, you know? Like, there's this really weird lefty position that every person who's homeless or every, like, homeless drug addict or whatever or every super poor person on the street are all, like, really safe, innocent, on. That's like, come on, right? Like, especially with the homelessness thing, man. I'm, like, super fucking hard on the LAPD for the what they did to homeless people in L.A. and in Humboldt with the Humboldt police and everything. But the idea that homeless people aren't potentially, at least, a danger is really weird. I don't know where that, like... I don't know. A lot of lefties just seem to be willfully, like, delusional on that. Oh, neat. Drug users are criminals trope? Well, yeah, center spiral. By definition, yes, drug users, if by drugs you mean crack, are criminals. That is true. Yes. But more broadly, if your position is people who do crack on the subway might be a threat to others, yes, I also believe that. You'd do well to say why the homeless are more hostile? Because a lot of them are mentally ill drug addicts? We're not- are we too woke to say that? Is that- is that not PC? That's true. That- that's a big reason. Doesn't mean we shouldn't, like, fix the social problems that caused them to be in that position. We absolutely should, but I don't know why... I don't know why we have to pretend that that's not a thing. I love Wave 9. Oh, I love Wave 9. We're all gamers here? That's true. Bayonetta. Well, we're waiting for somebody to join a Zoom call that I'm sitting in. Um, see if we can't have a conversation. Bosh, I was letting my dog in, but if all you point to is criminality based on unjust laws... Criminality is a legal definition, so I would point to unjust laws for the definition of criminality. I guess we are done here, Tucker Carlson. Okay. Um, hmm. How do we... We'll probably get the dodge here, and... Speed? Sure. It's rough out here, guys. Damage and lifesteal. Do we want that? Maybe. Crack addicts, agents of coolness, and heroin addicts, pure methods. Yeah. Can you just compare this to why we don't smoke cigs or anything else either? That's the point I've been making in chat. Well, yeah, you shouldn't smoke cigarettes in the subway either. You're in a contained space. Um, like, yeah. You shouldn't drink on the subway either, even though drinking doesn't even produce fumes that other people inhale. It's because these are these are, these chemical substances um, can be disruptive towards the environment that we're trying to cultivate here, which is a clean, uh, socially accessible one, you know?
Homelessness is the problem, not crack. Crack is also not good, just to be clear. Just so we're all fully clear on my on my positions here. I am I'm I am not anti-homelessness, anti or sorry, pro-crack. I'm anti-homelessness and anti-crack. I do believe in drug decriminalization, but that doesn't mean I'm not anti those drugs. It just means I don't think they should be criminalized. Mm. Fuck. Okay. Alright. Rough out here, guys. What do you think? You think we're gonna win this one? Why is everyone being so Pepega? Um, I don't know. It's all good. Uh, oh, I love my Pepega chat. Jordan Peterson said you should air fry Wagyu beef. I saw that, man. That was so fucking funny, dude. Holy shit. Forgot what Pepega means. Nothing good. His food takes are insane. Well, yeah, man. I mean, he's literally been, like, like lobotomized by his daughter. Um, and he did that all-meat diet, and he looks like a, a ghoul dying. Not surprising to me he might have bad takes on the subject. I feel like we're in a lot of trouble this run. I don't know why, because it seems like we're doing pretty good. But I feel like we're actually fucked. Have I gotten a goddamn DM back? No? Um, okay. I guess we'll give him like 10 more minutes. Alright, we have enough lifesteal now. Tucker Carlson supporting smoking on the house floor. Yeah, I noticed that Tucker Carlson did a segment recently where he was, like, defending smoking? Not even, like, the right to smoke, but, like, actively defending smoking itself. Um, I, ca I can't believe how often the culture war discourse boils down to, like, um, I I'm going to crush my greasy cock and balls with this big rock. Oh, oh, god, oh, fuck. Like, like every time... Literally just supporting bad things because they're bad. It's incredible. The level of contrarian bullshit. Oh, fuck. See, we, we have no health. We, like, lose it all in one hit. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Give me tortured cock and ball. That's good. That's really good, actually. Should alcohol be permitted on planes? Um, yeah, you can drink alcohol in first class. Oh fuck, I want I want three of these. Um, which do I want most? I'll take crit. Okay, we have a maxed out crit chance. We we don't need any more, like at all. We just need defensive stats for a bit. Okay, lifesteal. That's enough. We need armor and dodge. And health. Oh god. Sometimes Vosh has said people shouldn't drink on trains either. Okay, wait. To be clear. 
when I said people shouldn't drink on trains, what I meant was like the subway. If you're on, if you're on like a like a one of those long like Pacific Coast Highway trains or whatever, like one of the ones that have like actual cabin seats and stuff, that I'm okay with. What well, I don't consider like those big like interstate trains to be public transportation in the same way that I'd consider like a bus or a uh, yeah like a subway car uh, public transportation. You know, those trains you actually like get a ticket and you have your own like little section of it. It's like a separate thing. You know. Also, in planes, you don't just drink a brown bag of 40 that you bring with you. They serve you the alcohol, and there's also an air marshal on board. Why shouldn't you get a drink on the subway? Because on the subway, you're, like, packed into a car with a bunch of other people um, who are just there to, like, get to their work or whatever. Um, you're, you're, like, just on seats. You're just, like, you're, like, sloshing around in a big car container. Um, you're not, like, in a separate cabin that you've paid a ticket for. Cop. Oh, God, why are you guys so obsessed with making things worse for the people around you? There we go. Hundred and eighty seven for eight max HP, sure. We actually have a really good setup here. Should you be able to drink and drive, be honest? Well that well obviously drinking and driving is okay, because the car you're in is your own vehicle. It's not public transportation, so you don't have to um, you don't have to adhere to public decorum. Obviously, it just makes sense. Oh shit. Oh my god, dude, we need to get armor so badly. We literally have negative armor right now. The cost for this critical strike chance. I don't think this guy's coming, guys, I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just still stunned as you homed me as wanting to do a crack in the subway because you can't justify... Sander Spire, what are you saying? Can't justify your intolerance of people existing in the conditions they have no choice in. Um, listen, if the conditions they have no choice in is doing crack on the subway, then they do have a choice, and the choice is to not do crack in the subway. I'm standing by that. More health. We'll take the EXP gain. Okay. Eight health for some dodge. Wait, fuck, I should have gotten that. That would have given me more money. God damn it, I'm so fucking stupid. Oh my god. Hold on. Literally, I have a 100% crit chance. The item that I just skipped by was, hey, every time you kill an enemy with a crit, there's a chance of you getting extra money. That would have been nice. Literally increased my total wealth exponentially. Whoa. You can't just always fall back in your choices, chat. You have to... Yeah, okay, guys. Don't remember, systemic critique doesn't mean you don't do the personal responsibility memes, right? Like... Systemically, we understand that men are socially discouraged from um, showing their emotions and being sociable, but that doesn't mean that they don't have to exercise personal responsibility when it comes to not being a fucking freak around women, right? Like, yeah. Um, likewise, I sympathize with the conditions that lead to poverty, but don't do crack in my fucking subway train. If I do this, I'll have negative six armor. I'll literally die in one hit to like anything, but oh my god, I want to so badly. Oh my god, I will. Oh, I'm gonna do it. <gasps> we better find some armor. We need to find some armor right now. We're fucked.
Seriously? None? Dude, really? Fuck, okay. Let's just not get hit here, I guess. I'm gonna declare Kurzgesagt the winner of today's debate. That's probably accurate. Hated one not coming on L. Um, yeah, that's kind of weird. I wonder if maybe there's a time zone confusion? But he specified PT, so... Did you panic stasis? I'm enjoying it a lot. Okay, this round doesn't have much to attack us with. That's good. Please, God, let us get armor the next one. I swear to God, one of these hits would kill. Whoop. He's busy smoking crack in the subway. Oh, shit! It all comes back around. We get into a pitched six-hour debate where the, the, the finishing blow for me actually comes on the... the subway crack issue. Can we please get some armor? 16 damage? Oh my god, dude. The game keeps giving me... No, I have to get the armor. I have to get the armor. I'm gonna be responsible. Oh my god. It's the game keeps trying to pull me away. I'm still at negative three armor. I'll take rip and tear. Mmm, power generator is amazing. Because we're so fast. I guess the game just... There's no armor. No armor items. Armor is illegal. It's 8.30? Yeah, well, at this point, we're almost done with this, this match, so... I'm gonna finish that shit, I guess. That kind of sucks. I won the convo. I, was, I wasn't gonna be blood sportsy at all. I just wanted to, like, ask him to justify his stuff. You know? How similar is this game to Vampire Survivors? Um, it- oh, fuck. It's similar in a lot of ways. Not perfectly. Yeah, I guess so, Flavier. Now let me just finish this, I guess. Whoa. Debate Center Spiral? Um, I mean, yeah, just from chat. I don't know if I want to put up a debate on my channel that's like, is it ethical? Should you smoke crack on subway cars? Lefties discuss. Speed, damage, luck. Dodge. Where's block? I'll take dodge here. Okay, this is the extra money. Wow, there really are just like no armor items in the shop. It just doesn't exist. It's not legal. Oh, here we go. Two armor. Oh, thank the lord. Now we're at only negative one armor. Whoa. Whoa. Let me win. Don't smoke in public, but there should be places you can do drugs safely. Yes, I agree with that. I mean, I agree with the logic behind safe injection sites, so it makes sense that I would agree with safe crack smoking sites. Though, since that doesn't use needles, it doesn't really... It's not necessary in the same way, I guess, but... Armor. Armor! God almighty. Can I smoke crack in your bathroom? No. Denying you. I'm authority- I'm denying you in an authoritarian fashion.
You ever see Hassan debating Jank over crime in LA a couple months ago? Really interesting. Wait, what was the debate on? Does anyone know? <gasps> Danil? Danil? Wow. I am careful. He's wiggly. Here. He w he wants to go. Here. He wants food. Um. Scrungly. Not letting Daniil get in the way of my clean finish. I haven't beaten the, uh, the game with this character before. I lost a round with him right before stream started. I'm, I've got the momentum. I've got the drive to survive. I feel like the subway's got to be one of the top five places to not smoke crack. That's my personal opinion as well, but I'll admit that I'm not an expert at smoking crack. Not an experience I've ever had. High on life, etc., etc. We still die in two hits in a row. We're so fucking fragile, man. Okay, this is our last wave to purchase stuff in. I'll take melee damage. Um, I don't think this guy's gonna show up. Yeah, I guess not. Please, give me something defensive here. I don't really care about HP regen. Where are the hat items? Like the helmet and stuff, where I trade speed for armor. Where is it? We have been fucking shafted this run, boys. Holy shit. Okay, well, it's down to luck now. At the last wave, you just have to survive for 90 seconds or kill the boss. Either gets you the win. Because there are like pacifist builds and stuff where you don't do any damage at all. We don't do very much damage, do we? I had more range, but I have to stay pretty close to him. Oh, fuck, I just took it. Don't kill me. Oh. Okay, we got it. Nice, nice go, team. We got so unlucky there. We got so unlucky with the armor there, man. Holy shit. Sniper gun. Gun precise. That's a cool item. Okay, cool. Alright. Hey. Howdy. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. How about yourself? Well, it could be better, I'll admit. I, uh... We lasted two years without getting COVID, but then on Saturday I got it, so I it could be better, but I'm happy to be here. Did you uh, did you get the jab, the Fauci ouchie? Have you been protected by our Lord and Savior? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was actually. I did get it. Oh, okay. Well, then, hey, I, it'll all be okay. As 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 yeah. it's well known, the uh, COVID vaccine is 100 percent effective. <laughs> Of course, of course. He, he, they would never lie to us. So how you doing? Apart from that, I mean, broadly. Uh, broadly, 
solid. Well, I'm happy to hear that. So, well. so yeah, you didn't really uh, give too much about what we're going to discuss going into this, which is perfectly fine with me, because that means we're going in on an even ground. But what were you hoping to discuss? Well, you suggested a couple of things, but considering the state of Florida right now with Ron DeSantis uh, having books from schools all across the state pulled, uh, it seemed kind of apropos to talk about that and the don't say gay nonsense and everything in that um, ballpark. Sure, and I'm definitely more familiar with the original don't say gay bill than anything that's happened too recently. And I'm also even more familiar with what's going on in my home state of Virginia rather yeah. than Florida. The broad subject is fine by me. The particulars of any yeah, law yeah. are going to be pretty similar given the state of things. That's fair. So yeah. And yeah, I just want... I just want to say, I have watched you for a while as kind of my, I don't know, leftist YouTuber that I watch, because I like the way that you approach issues, the way that you look at things. So I think our mindsets are pretty similar with how we approach issues, if nothing else. And that might make for a pretty good discussion. Yeah, well, if nothing else, we'll be putting that belief to the test here. Um, <laughs> sure. So if you've watched my stuff, then you're familiar enough with my positions. Um, it seems to Definitely. me like right now the Republicans are engaged in like an absolutely psychotic politicization of medicine where they, um, you know, lie nonstop about the state of trans people and trans uh, child health care uh, as a way of legitimizing legislation against them. And my hot take is that this is bad. Uh, how about yourself? Well, the way that I see it, particularly in my state, there have been a lot of examples of teachers, and especially in the early levels of education, that these bills tend to focus on. I remember the original Don't Say Gay bill was like kindergarten to third grade. And at that age, I don't think that teachers should be putting their values or the values of the education system, whatever it is, on students. I think that parents should be able to decide, broadly speaking, what is in a curriculum, what's not in a curriculum. And just to clarify, I know a lot of conservatives push this patriotic education thing as an alternative to what's currently happening. And I just want to say, I think that's just as bad. I see that as just, you know, basically state indoctrination. So I think that schools, especially at those lower levels, should be as apolitical as they can possibly be. And obviously that's never going to be perfect, but we shouldn't be doing patriotic education or education around LGBTQ issues in those early levels, you know, K through three. But how can you say that teachers can't impose their political values on students when that's the entirety of a teacher's job? I mean, if we're talking about like curriculum business, everything from, uh, you know, American history, especially, but from like biology to science is contested by some group of people in this country. It seems like if, if, if the statement is like parents should have um, complete control over the curriculum that's taught to their kids, then we, there's no point in public education. Then the point is to set a standard that all students are taught by so that we can have a basic expectation for people's competence and knowledge. If parents decide that, what's the point of it? Well, I'd say that in certain issues like, I mean, we're talking about the, the, excuse me, the stuff targeted by the Don't Say Gay bill is LGBTQ issues, right? And whether or not kids should be told about gay issues and, you know, trans issues by teachers rather than by their parents well, at that to, young of an age. To, to be clear, like the legislation against it is um, forbidding any discussion of gender or sexuality at that age. Um, yeah which is ridiculous. Uh, discussions of gender and sexuality are omnipresent uh, from people talking about like where babies come from or that they're having a kid or that they got married recently. Uh, any like playground discussion on boys and girls or it's not nice to like hit a girl or like anything like that. All of that by the name of the law, um, like it, it all fits that category. It's, it's totally imprecise. It's just a way for the state to illegalize the specific discussion of certain minority groups, it seems. Well, you mentioned the example of, you know, how a baby is made. I also don't think that teachers should be telling kids how babies are made at that age, you know, because that's not something that the average, you know, kindergartner walks around knowing. What about like and, uh, remedial sex education in like second grade or something? I've not heard of sex education in second grade. Well, why not? It's pretty important. In second grade, I mean, that's well before puberty has started. That's well before teachers should be exposing students to the type of thing, you know? Why? Kids really shouldn't be exposed to sexuality that early on in life. There's studies, and I don't have them, I can probably Google it, that will damage the 
excuse me, the, that will damage kids' brain if they're like have early exposure to porn. And, not... Like I'm talking really early. I know we're not talking about porn, and I'm sorry to make that the well, topic. Yeah, because but... like yeah. we're we're not. But sexuality comes up way before second grade. Like you, like when I was in preschool, people would still like talk about you know, oh, is that your girlfriend? Oh, is that your boyfriend? Like that kind of stuff. The idea of the state stepping in and making that a felony, like any discussion of anything sexuality related, it's like really weird to me, considering the fact that it seems like it's been pretty normalized up until this point. We only very suddenly have an issue with it. Um, and also, uh, like, they should be getting sex education at that age. That's the best way to prevent them from being sexually abused, right? Well, I'll start with the first issue, which was that... Sorry, can, the first... I'm sorry. Uh, okay, the first issue you were saying that kids should okay well we'll start with just the kids education uh, the only Sorry. just just to call be, it call it call to, it covid brain fog. no it's it's Go totally ahead. fine uh, i just want to say keep in mind that whatever case you make has to be worthwhile enough for a totally unprecedented uh state law imposition threatening to charge teachers with felonies for bringing this up you know like so so we're we're not only talking about well is it appropriate is it not there are lots of things you can do that are inappropriate that don't get felonies thrown at you by the state. We're, we you have to justify like an insane level of threat in order to um, approve this like uh, this uh, like state authoritarian bullshit. Okay, sure. So if you mentioned you know kids in preschool saying, "Oh, that's my boyfriend, that's my girlfriend," if two kids that you know were, had that sort of thing going on, like oh, you know they're quote unquote dating in preschool, whatever. You know, that happens, kids are kids. And they went up to a teacher, and a teacher encouraged that and encouraged that in a sexual way. Do you think that would be okay? We're not talking about in a sexual way. Sexuality doesn't mean that things are done in a sexual way. I would say that all of it surrounds, I mean, you mentioned sex education in the second grade, so that was my interpretation, is that you're arguing that those sort of those sort of things should be sexualized at that early of an age. Yeah, sex ed is one thing. You're talking about directly referring to two children's interactions with each other. Uh, that's That can be sexuality, but okay. not sex. Like, like you're mentioning sexuality. If, um, if you bring, if you're like a female teacher and you bring in a, your husband, you're like, hey, this is my husband. That right there is a mention of sexuality, flat out. That doesn't mean you're like having sex in front of the kids or whatever. That just means sexuality got mentioned because that's what, you're you're doing when you indicate that you have a husband. Yeah. I, okay. I I think you are. You're right about that. The the distinction definitely. So I'm. It just seems weird ahead. that there'd be like a threat of felony over this. Yes, I think what the idea of it targeting is, and again, the laws vary in specifics, but teaching kids about something that is controversial such as you know transgender stuff telling kids that they can be transgender at that early of an age like again we're talking about kindergarten i'm someone personally i'm not against but I, i'm pro-gay i absolutely am like if you want if that's the lifestyle that people want to live i mean i have friends that are gay like if that's the lifestyle you want to live absolutely go for it but at that early of an age i just don't think that teachers should be teaching kids that imposing their own political values instead of letting parents dictate that and teach their own kids in a separate setting from school. But we've already and been I understand in this I world. reverted back. Yeah, the talking, but, the teaching of political values is yeah. always the case when we talk about these teachers' yeah, curriculum. I don't think that's true. It is. They would say the same thing about teaching evolution. They would say the same thing about teaching anything involving climate science or the recent changes to the climate. Anything involving U.S. history, like the Civil War or the uh, Civil Rights Act especially. Um, there's no getting around the political nature. We need to talk about actual harm because if the, if the harm here is some people might disagree, then my response, of course, is like, well, I don't fucking care if they disagree. I need to be explained to like, how does it harm these kids? And as for like, t like, you know, you teaching these kids, um, like, oh, well, you could be trans. Well, first of all, I don't know how often this happens. When I talk to cons, it seems like they think it happens 24 seven. I think like the actual context of this discussion is like, well, anyone could be gay, right? Like a teacher mm -hmm. could be talking about, ah, you know, well, a lot of a lot of boys like girls. Sometimes boys like boys. And like, you know, that could be anyone or whatever. And then that gets interpreted as the teacher like grooming the kids into being gay, when in reality they're making a truthful statement. 
Yeah, I, the point where I disagree with you is where you say that it doesn't matter if people disagree. Because when you look at a state like Florida, where there's a substantial portion of parents that would be against, you know, transgender people becoming trans fundamentally, which again, I'm not. But when you look at that, I think there's an issue with schools taking, well, not taking, well, yeah, taking in the kids and then teaching them values that are contradictory to their parents. Why I, I would I care? Like there are a lot of people in Mississippi who think that the South started, or sorry, the North started the Civil War. Does that mean they should like teach fake history? Why, the, why are the opinions of the parents at all relevant? Because they're funding it. That doesn't matter. It's public education. That would be like saying that because the majority of people don't agree that a crime is okay, that the cops shouldn't like enforce it. Or because the majority of people don't like a given... What? Um, like politician, that they should just like ignore any laws or edicts passed by. It doesn't make sense. The institution is not one which parents have a say on. We have educational professionals. Like, why would we defer to the majority there? They could be wrong. They are wrong here. Well, I think, I don't know if this is this way in every state necessarily, but parents do and should have a direct role on public school education because it is being funded directly within the jurisdictions. I mean, they go forward, they vote for school board members, and then they'll directly elect school board members who set policy for the schools. Like that is directly giving them a say in the public education system. Yeah. And if those, should... if those elected people want to make those decisions, then they have to do so through existing processes, not by a, like a governor arbitrarily like deciding for its people like, ah, well, we are now going to politicize education by threatening felonies for teachers who don't follow these guidelines. Um, if, if we have a system of public accountability, then stick by it or not, um, because that system of public accountability wouldn't allow the Republicans to do what they really want to do, which is threaten teachers into uh, shutting up or being arrested. Oh, I, yeah, I, I don't think that's the logical extreme of that, but that's, that's, regardless, that, they're, they're doing it. It's already happening in Florida. It is a felony to talk about some fairly reasonable topics with young people or to even have books with the subject matter present in it. It's happening right now. If you take a, a system that is funded by parents, that has school board elected officials... Funded uh, by citizens. Elects, funded by citizens, yes, that's absolutely fair. The citizens being the people who are then sending their kids to the public schools. And then you have school board officials elected. The issue is that the school board officials don't have the power to make these sort of things illegal. Because school board officials, they do have a degree of power they can set curriculums but they don't have the power i like they certainly don't have power to make it criminal but i don't think they have the power to ban and enforce that's because we, and feel free to correct me if i'm wrong on that they have the power to ban and enforce a ban on like discussing transgender issues in the jurisdiction that's because we live in a free country and it shouldn't be possible to do that like what you're what you're saying right now is like yeah we had to go over that we had to over, we had to supersede that like system of checks and balances because we need to have the power to arrest teachers for not teaching doctrinally acceptable information. Would I don't think you we, should I don't think that power should teachers. Exist. I think that if school board officials you like you're counter to my previous point that well school board officials are elected they don't have the power to do it and I don't think it's the free no. country is changing no. to that because the system is being funded by the parents. You should not be able. No, no, no. The fact that taxpayers point? fund public schooling does not necessarily lead to it should be okay to charge teachers with felonies for teaching subjects parents in a district disagree with. That's insane. That that's that's an insane you realize that, right? Like that's this is like full on like totalitarian logic where like ah, well for the, the you know be it the Aryan people who send their children, it'll be the Aryan people's interest who dictates whether or not degeneracy gets taught to your kids. It's like the same logic that totalitarian governments have used in the past. It, it doesn't follow. I actually do agree that it shouldn't be a felony. But would you agree then that it's fair to remove the teachers from being teachers for teaching things that, let's say, the school board would disapprove of, of the district, the parents, the citizens of the district would disapprove of. No. Would it be fine to remove them from the teaching post because they're telling, they're being paid by the citizens to teach the, you know, teach the children stuff that the citizens will content, in this case, transgender issues that the citizens disagree with. They are being paid to 
fulfill a certain role, which is to make sure that the students are educated on the curriculum topics. As long as they're doing that, they're doing their job. If they're doing something inappropriate, then it should be judged by the existing standards we have to determine what's inappropriate. Like if they're harassing children or being super rude or they're intolerable to work with, but saying, yay, everyone, you know, like anyone could be gay, who knows? That's not, that doesn't meet those standards. Um, it's not in the curriculum to talk about transgender issues in it, second grade. It's not in the curriculum to talk about what you had for breakfast that morning, but second grade teachers will bring it up anyway. I don't think teachers should lose their job. And that's what I'm saying, that that's an issue they something. shouldn't bring up. So what, what they had for breakfast? They should lose their job for bringing up what they no, had for no. breakfast? No, no. They shouldn't bring up transgender issues separately from the curriculum. You have you failed to explain to me in any way how it's necessary to have this weird separate standard to like completely depose from education anyone who deviates from curriculum on this, even though no harm can be determined and we deviate from curriculum all the time. All teachers do. If teachers didn't deviate from curriculum, every course in America would be exactly the same. It's teachers' idiosyncrasies that determines whether or not students will remember them. Uh, by the book, curriculum teachers are hated. Nobody likes them because curriculums are often like a very basic template you're supposed to build off of. Sure, but with everything else I said building up to this about the, who's funding it and how the school boards don't really have power to enforce anything, I think that it's reasonable yeah, for... You shouldn't throw out teachers. Okay, that was the buildup. Oh, okay, but, but you, shouldn't, you shouldn't throw teachers out for saying stuff that doesn't, that isn't in the curriculum. Not, well, for saying this specific stuff, not anything in general. Like, uh, it's not just, oh, you have to, you know, read from a script the entire school year. I mean, that's ridiculous, but it, you shouldn't, if you discuss issues that the people that are paying you to teach in like directly pretty much i mean the taxpayers the people of the district they should be able to enforce the t sort of things you can talk about because it's their dime it's their government that no, they're electing it's public, to teach their children it's public education should we not teach children about climate change or should we not teach them about education or should we not teach them about the civil rights movement if our if like the constituency suddenly becomes very anti-semitic should we just be like oh of course now teaching that the Holocaust was real will get you uh, charged with a felony. Like, wh why would we, why does empirical truth have to be subject to the biases and bigotries of like the dumb fucks who happen to pay their taxes? Well, I'd say that public education exists to serve the people who are paying for the public education. So you, so you would I be okay my... with the Holocaust teaching being fireable if America went anti-Semitic enough? That's talking about a dystopian reality. No, like, well, no, no, not... wait, you have to answer that. So based on your logic, that would be yes. You do believe that then. I mean, I actually have to think about that one. Really? But... You, you have to think I, about... I do, and here's why, because they're funding. It doesn't matter. Like, the, no, the point of public education is to educate the public. Like, if you if I you would, think like, oh, well, because the public is retarded, therefore we should teach the, the students retarded things. That's the opposite of would, the point. Can you yeah. imagine when public education started would, really becoming a thing back in the early uh, 1900s? Can you imagine if they had to teach students stuff in line with what their parents believed? Oh my God, it would all be like, yeah, sprinkle salt on the entrance to your, your hallway in order to prevent spirits from, like, it'd be insane. Like, we, like no, the, the point here is to elevate people above the, the ignorance, not to wallow in it just because taxpayers are stupid. I would say that the distinction lies in the extreme that you brought it to, because I would say, you know, denying the Holocaust is orders of magnitude like worse than not teaching third graders that you know a stuff is the transgender and gay issues at least until middle school like i mean we're talking about kindergartners here and that's an important part to remember i mean these people haven't hit puberty so they can have it mentioned to them that's fine if, you, if you're a kindergarten teacher and at some point the subject of gay people comes up and you're like yeah that's okay some people are like that and that's fine i don't see what the issue is with that the issue is when teachers you know, use it as a platform for, I mean, I hate the word indoctrination, but that's really what it is. When we talk about patriotic education, as some conservatives have proposed being, you know, state indoctrination to be patriotic, which it is, that's what it is. If, if we use the indoctrination word for that, then we can also use it for this. What indoctrination is happening? If a teacher actively promotes 
you know, issues such as being gay and being trans wait, wait, that are wait. contrary. The law isn't promotes. The law is mentions. Keep that in mind. Mentions as in like teaches. No, like no mentions. The the um to the point now where like in Florida they're taking away any books that might have content that is considered by the state to contain um any themes involving LGBT issues. That's not promoting. That's any mention of it at all. That's that's trying to excise any mention of it. And I think the reason that they prescribed it that way, the reason that they put it that way in the law is just to create no uncertain terms around teachers trying to teach it. Because I th there are there is proof that before these sort of laws came into existence and currently happening in states where these laws are not in existence, teachers at as low as the kindergarten levels are doing what could be seen as a sort of indoctrination. Like what? Into How is it indoctrination? So what is the definition like, uh, of indoctrination? I mean, I can literally Google that if you'd like, but I, if we're using the term indoctrination for patriotic education, then it can also be applied for this in the same but way. But I want to know what your definition of, of indoctrination is. All right, let me look. One moment. And how does it differ from just regular teaching? Oh, that's actually a good definition. Because, okay, the definition is the process of teaching a person or group to accept a set of beliefs uncritically with the word uncritically underlined. So like when Sesame Street says sharing is good, is that indoctrination? <laughs> I would say around controversial issues is where indoctrination is, can be applied. Okay, so when Sesame Street back in the 1990s had a black kid on with the rest of the Muppets, and uh, they had a, uh, an episode that was about racial equality where they said we should all get along, that was a controversial episode that got like a lot of uh, flack around the place. So that would be it's indoctrination? No, that wouldn't be indoctrination. That's that was not... a controversial issue that they told people to accept uncritically. I mean, that's uh, also not in a classroom setting. That's Sesame Street. But Wait, hold, well, hold on. Indo the definition I, I'm... of indoctrination isn't limited exclusively to the classroom. That's fair. Okay. In that case, we can say, sure, and not all indoctrination is bad. Okay. So, <laughs> well, then I would fully agree with that. So, okay. Um, if the, if the message is sharing is good, uh, could be considered indoctrination. Um, the idea of we should all get along could be considered indoctrination. Well, then how about, uh, you know, trans and gay people exist and that's okay. If that, if that is an uncritical value being put forward, which is controversial, if that meets the definition of indoctrination, then I will accept it. I will simply say that it is good. Okay. And the reason that I'll say it isn't is again going back to the fact that these are young children being taught by parents so who, sorry being taught by teachers that are being paid by parents so that so indoctrination on issues where i again we go back to that on the fundamental issue and you can just bring up the Weimar Republic, or whatever it is, excuse me, the teaching about um, Holocaust denial one again. I, I mean, the, pe the people who agree yeah. with you on this issue also are the ones who would deny the Holocaust, right? Like Holocaust deniers in the U.S. <laughs> would say the same thing, so. like we need to protect our children from these values. But like, OK, I don't think you could find Ron DeSantis denying the Holocaust. But no, oh, no, not in public. Um, so, OK, <laughs> it's the night. It's the late 1960s. It's the post civil rights era and uh, integration is happening all over America. This is an extremely controversial thing. I mean, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. died an unpopular man. Um, and all across America, you have teachers who are now having to deal with mixed race kindergarten classrooms that they have to teach. They express the controversial value of no matter the race, we should all get along. We all get along here. Parents are furious. Your ideology would lead to those teachers who paved the pathway for racial integration in America to be arrested or removed from their jobs because their indoctrination of we should all treat each other equally regardless of race was disagreeable to the parents. That seems I, bad to yeah. me. Yeah. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. And that is, it goes back to the interesting issue of the integration in public schools, because that's an issue that I researched quite a bit. And I've actually never thought of this issue compared to the integration before, which is definitely putting a different mind frame on it. Um, I know you're just waiting for me to talk here because I, I I have to admit you have um, you have me convinced on most of this because the wording of the bill was especially the felony part like that's not excusable. Um, Even without the felony, those teachers still would have lost their jobs. The parents would have pushed for teachers to fill their roles who would not have accepted racial integration. And we would have had the same issues over and over again. The only reason we were able to accept integration as a country was because we had an entire generation of young people who were raised on the idea that, yes, regardless of your skin color, we all belong here. We all deserve to be treated equally. But your ideology would lock us forever um, in reactionary thought, making it impossible to improve or grow. Every cultural standard that, uh, that changes would just be reversed by angry suburban you know, soccer mom dipshits who get angry that their kids are being taught about gender ideology or racial integration. Is school the only place where that can happen, though? Because, I mean, the kids' minds are just so malleable at that young age. Yeah, so better teach them good you, ideas. Well, if you end up with a teacher that has values completely contradictory to... Like, I, I don't know. Let's say that a teacher was in the case of something that you would disagree with and I would also disagree with... Let's say that a teacher was hired who was just a full-on Nazi. Like, would they be able to go in and teach the kids, you know, that Jewish people are bad and that, you know, disabled people should be put in camps? Well, if they did that, then we should... Is that their right as a teacher? Go ahead. No, we should have them fired. Because they're teaching something bad, but the trans and gay stuff isn't bad. We're just evaluating people's behavior here based on its actual worth. You know, like, I don't have an issue with teachers getting fired or even brought felony charges if they do something actually wrong. But it ain't wrong to teach kids that it's okay to be gay or trans or whatever. Yeah, I guess you, I guess I am just viewing it from a lens of the parents want to see their kids be taught about those issues either at a later age or by them rather than. Trust. by a teacher who radically disagrees with their ideology. Trust me, the parents who think that teachers should be charged with felonies for mentioning gay or trans people in kindergarten are not then okay with their kids being taught this stuff in fourth grade. Um, they just want, they, they just think trans people and gay people are degenerates who shouldn't be taught about at all. Um, there's, there's no middle ground on this. But also, parents are retards. All parents, at least conservative parents, think that children are just little properties of them little automatons that they want to see grow into an exact replica of them. I don't think they have any right to dictate the future of these children. If we believe that parents have the total right to dictate the future of these children, then we wouldn't have, like, an actual public school system. We would just have a bunch of, like, you know, uh, decentralized home education systems. I, I don't think that's right. Children should be able to have their own lives with a shared experience based in firm, uh, ethically defensible values. I, th I, th I mean, wouldn't it be better for the children, though, to not face any sort of political indoctrination or absolutely minimal? I mean, you mentioned that there's always political discussion in classrooms, but I think a lot of that, especially around issues that are controversial for a culture at a time, can be held off until middle and high school when the children's minds are more developed. Like, it's okay to treat black and white people the same? Because that was an issue they had to address day one. And trust me, gay kids in kindergarten are not going to appreciate being made to wait till ninth grade for their classmates to be told it's not okay to be homophobic. I mean, even in, I'm just thinking about, I'm trying to think back. I mean, I don't really have memory of elementary school, to be completely honest with you. I don't think many people do. But I just don't remember ever being taught about anything remotely controversial at that time. The, well, I mean, you're, you're searching then, back through like pretty old memories here. Yeah, but, that's true. Uh, like, if, depending on what you were taught, like I was taught that climate change was happening. I was taught evolution was happening. Um, 
I was taught, uh, uh, I was taught about the civil rights movement. I was taught about the civil war in the context of the South being in the wrong. These are all issues that have had like literal decades of, of like massive public outrage at them being like taught. Parents have long hated. Just a couple days ago, there was a gigantic uh, Nazi homeschooling ring that was busted. Um, like two and a half thousand uh, parents were together in like a group chat where they were trying to raise their kids on Aryan values, you know? Um, and they would have said the same thing, right? Like, well, I don't want my kids being taught about like racial equality. I don't want my kids being taught about like that it's okay to be gay or trans, you know? Um, but who cares if something kids get taught is controversial? What matters is whether or not it's right. It, how much harm would be done, though, if we waited until the minds were able to, th like, children were able to think more critically? I mean, in elementary school, you kind of believe whatever you're told because adults are right about everything. But when, yeah, when you go into high school, I think that's the time to bring up in more substantive discussion and teaching issues there, about there's nothing... trans and gay. And honestly, if you go back to the civil rights era with the example that you mentioned, I think that there wouldn't be too much of a difference if it was taught in middle school versus elementary school. There's nothing harmful about teaching young kids about gay and trans people, though. I don't know why, like, you, you keep implying there is, but I just, I don't think that there is. Um, also, like, go back to the civil rights era example. If you go back to post-integration, you know, like, imagine you have, like, white kids in your kindergarten class who are being racist as fuck against the black kids. And that's not, like, a joke. That really happened. A lot of these white suburban kids were being taught racist shit from like day one, like literally like out the fucking womb with these kids, you know? And then they go to a recently integrated public school and are sitting next to a black kid and they're saying the fucking N word. And like now the teacher's sitting there thinking, damn, I'm gonna lose my job if I say that you should uh, treat people of different races equally. Like that's what you're advocating. That teacher would lose their job for saying it. What do they do? Just say like, no bullying like a bunch of white kids are like screaming the n-word at one black girl in the class and the teacher's like hey come on no swears and then like at ninth grade they get to hear that it's wrong to be racist all because the right position that racism is bad is controversial with the dipshits in the neighborhood it doesn't seem right i mean you won't run into the issue of bullying at a young age with that i mean i do you, can, i'm actually curious what you think i this isn't me trying to deviate i will respond more directly to that but do you think people can be gay in kindergarten? Yeah, of course. Or trans? People are Okay, personally, are I don't think that sort of sexual attraction, straight or gay, whatever it is, starts until puberty. But, pe well, wait, that's definitely not true. Prepubescent kids okay. absolutely develop crushes on, on other kids, for sure. Okay, I think crushes aren't that's a, necessarily that's, sexual. That's no, it, no, no, no. Right? Sexuality but. doesn't mean sexual. Like, when I was, like, a five-year-old boy, there were girls in my class who I thought were cute, but I didn't know what sex was at that age. But my sexuality still determined who I thought was cute. Okay, and that sexuality is going to then transmit into post-puberty as uh, well. Well, I ended up being bi, um, so I'm not the best yeah. example. But there are plenty of straight people who were straight and had straight crushes back in, um, back, like, for as, as early as they can remember, you know? Yeah. All right. Well, in that point, in that case, I guess the point about younger kids being gay is valid. And I'd say in the case of bullying with that, it is kind of fair to just say no bullying. I mean, I view that in the same way. If, I mean, if a kid is being bullied in kindergarten for being gay, I'd, I'd view that the exact same way as a kid who was bullied for being like anything else, any other physical or so you, any other characteristic of that. You would support like you that teacher losing their job for promoting racial equality there? I wouldn't say... Is, would there be an effective difference between treating it as everyone should be treated as... Well, okay, if you say no bullying, we need to treat everyone with respect. Is that not a solution that would work in that situation? Well, I mean, you have to teach racial equality. And like all the, all the controversial values that you think we should wait on, like lots of them are really important. Racial equality isn't like you, by the time a kid is 13 and in high school, they already have some pretty well-defined opinions on race. You should be teaching, teaching this as doctrine. You should be indoctrinating them. Yes, be kind to others, 
uh, don't be racist, don't be sexist, so on and so on. Those should be in, those should be dra like drilled into the kids' brains from as early an age as possible. I mean, I'd say treating people with respect as a basic premise should be drilled into everyone's brains as what, as, young why are you as possible. So, what? No, hold but on. Do you have Do you have to mention like? Is it necessary to talk about trans issues specifically in yes. that sort of teaching? Yes. You You have ethic? demonstrated no harm to doing it. Like we're we're in a position right now where you are more comfortable with a teacher losing their job for telling a bunch of white kids shouting the N-word to black girl to not be racist than you are with the idea of like any mention of gay or trans people, young people. Like from my position, yours is like psychotic. You're on the moon right now. Um, I have no idea where it comes from. Like, I, I don't know, like ethically, like how do you justify any of that crap? Um, if, if, we're, if we're talking about like on a fundamental level, what public education is for it's at the, at the root level it's to create good citizens that's why the state pays for it that's why the state spends its money on that and not entirely on planes um and we we need to teach them practical values but we need to teach them like socially like ethical positions you know like stuff that helps them integrate that helps them be a good citizen and a lot of those values are controversial a lot of stuff about history is controversial um but we can't shy away from controversy just because it's a controversy like you're advocating for a kind of anti-empiricism here where you socially deprioritize teaching correct things just because they're unpopular, which is weird. Like you're like the Catholic church killing Galileo, right? Um, it, it, like it doesn't make any sense. I don't think that that's the, the idea. The idea is to minimize at the, they, well, minimize teaching about issues that go against like, like okay they go against the values of the parents that i feel like a broken record at that point yeah but, but why it's why is because the purpose of public education isn't necessarily is is decided it will okay the purpose of public education is decided by the taxpayers the citizens the parents no that, <laughs> no it, it's it, it's it, not it, it, the, this, Taxpayers the paying for it tax, directly. So taxpayers pay for everything. Taxpayers pay for the CDC. Should we defer the CDC's research and positions to public like dictate? Should everything be done like, ah, our citizens pay the military, therefore, like we're now going to do like a Twitch chat let's play where every citizen gets to log in to like twitch.tv and like guide this drone as it bombs like Abdul Al Sharad um and well, his like insurgent group. It's Actually, a different that education. Dope. Who decides then? what's going on with what well, not what's going on who decides what the curriculum is in education the officials do yeah that well this in, is an in, element of like technocratic rule right you elect the officials but the officials know way more about this shit than the average um the average voter so we have to defer to them same thing that we do with um with with all kinds of elected positions really we do the same thing with judges and district attorneys it's not like that makes um like the district attorney's legal interpretation a matter of public uh interpretation yeah, so I think the fundamental difference, and I think you've pinpointed this already, you think that the purpose of public education is no matter what to teach the values that, I mean, for lack of a better word, you, for lack of a better phrase, you agree with. Well, and I think that the purpose of public education is to teach the values that the community is paying the public schools to teach. Which, so you would be in favor of like... Um like Holocaust denial being taught in like a far right society then? No, because, well, okay, in a far right society, you're looking at in a completely different situation. Well, not the way things are going it's... at the moment, no, but like, why not? <laughs> why not? I mean, why not would be because that's teaching something contradictory to the truth, but I think in that society, that would be what would happen i mean yeah but so but you're advocating for that as well the statement trans and gay people exist and it's okay to be them is a factually correct statement you're advocating for it not to be brought up maybe a, maybe a better analogy would be like in a far right society um you like the like young people are never taught about the civil rights movement or whatever um like like you have a bunch of like third grade history or whatever and it's like yeah basically 
um, white and black people have never gotten along and they still don't to this day and that's why we keep separate. And they were taught that. And they just skip over the actual civil rights movement, the downfall of society and blah blah. And you'd be like, oh, well, that's what the parents want, right? Well, I mean, I think you're actually, I mean, the way that I think about it now, I think you are, you're right about it should be teaching truth. I mean, I'm, I'm basically conceding a lot of it at this point by just asking this question. But in the scenarios that you hear about that are not, I know you're going to say these aren't common scenarios, so I'm just going to go ahead and preface it that way. Mm -hmm. But in the scenarios where a teacher does go in and essentially teach about gay issues, trans issues in a way that is almost like encouraging the kids to be gay or trans, that again, those are the moments that are you see about on social media and the news, particularly right wing news. Would that be okay? I really don't think it happens that often, but when it does, yeah, I think it's fine. I mean, teachers are like, um, yeah, you could be an astronaut. I mean, why not, right? No harm would need to be demonstrated for me to care. I see. Okay. Keep in mind, we do uh, groom children to be cishet all the time, though. The idea of like, yeah, when you get older, you're going to get a wife and get married. Or, oh, yeah, you'll have kids. That happens all the time, everywhere, constantly uh, to people starting basically from day one. So um, if we if we really are to tackle like the social pressure to adopt certain sexual or romantic tendencies in schools, that would be the one to go after first. Yeah, I guess just the idea of t well the t the idea to me of teachers going into a classroom and purposefully and i understand this isn't there's cases that the bill doesn't well there's cases beyond this that the bill targets but in the situation where teachers go in and they're you know going into the classroom and they actively encourage kids you know be gay be trans and then the parents see that the parents don't support that sort of teaching I just, I, That's where I've I never kind of seen, draw an issue. I don't think I've ever even seen that from like a libs of TikTok video. I don't think I've ever seen that. I feel well, like, I mean, I feel like the issue is flags in the classroom. I feel would be that's consistent with that. What? Displaying things like gay pride flags in the classroom. No, see, this is the issue. You, what you're, you're trying to come across as like moderate by bringing up only the most radical issue like so radical i've never even heard of it happening and you're like ah well they have pride flag having a pride flag is not going into a classroom and trying to force children to be gay um it's no matter of forcing i mean the minds are so amenable in like kindergarten they're just they just have a pride flag children can't be groomed into being gay because they saw a pride flag on their kindergarten teacher's desks that's not how it works and if that is how it works then again, there are a billion instances of cishet indoctrination to every one instance of non-cishet indoctrination, right? I don't think I've ever seen a video of like, like some like in-depth video or like, like secret, you know, a candid shot of parents, like, or sorry, of, of teachers actively saying like, you should be gay, you should be trans. I've never seen that happen. If that did happen, if that actually, those specific words, not like having a pride flag or whatever, if that happened, um... I, I would think that's pretty bad. That seems pretty weird to say to kids, but I've never seen it happen. I have seen teachers say stuff like you should have children. When you create a classroom environment where, you know, you have pride flags and it's an issue that's discussed often in the class, that opens that up. Like, I understand no, it's not no, directly no, no, no. saying. This is bullshit. Saying, oh, well, having like any mention of the issue means that slippery slope, you'll then have teachers coercing students. Nah, fuck, no. If this was happening, we would, no, I, I don't accept the premise at all. The problem is you consume so much conservative propaganda, which just sort of blurs together this behavior. So you think like, ah, well, it is happening somewhere, right? It's not happening. This is, this just isn't happening. Um, it, it, it's, it's fine. No harm is being done to children, at least not broadly through the existence of teachers who talk about these issues. Harm is being done to children like, in general, in a lot of ways, but this is not harming them. So if that were to happen where they set up the classroom with that sort of demeanor, that sort of, you know, the whole setup that I described earlier, would you be against that happening? Like, would you be support of a Parental Rights and Education Act to take the same name 
that explicitly just banned that sort of action and said teachers can be fired for that sort of action. What sort of action? Create like what I described before with setting up the classroom that you said the thing you said was firing happening. teachers for having gay and trans flag. No, no. What you said wasn't happening. No, Would you be I fine said... with banning what you said isn't happening. Wait, okay, hold on. No. Wait. I said teachers aren't going up to students and convincing them or coercing them to be gay or trans. Yes, teachers are putting up That's gay okay. and trans flags. That's fine. There's no harm being done there. Like, what harm is being done? It would only be harm in the eyes of the parents. Okay, that's not is, har then, it, then it's fake. Yeah. Then I, I defer to reels over feels on this one. Okay. Yeah. I guess if, with your perspective that public education exists to, you know, teach the, object teach the truth that, you know, you see to be the objective truth, I think that in that case then you would be correct on this. The Is that only really situation... so tough of a position to hold? I mean... When you think about... Again, I... Uh, like, you... Ha, I understand, yeah, I'm that's, starting to agree with you. That's your problem. That you think the purpose of education is to tell the truth. Like, well, I mean, you got me on that one. Well, <laughs> I just, when you look at it from the perspective of the parent who is paying the public schools to teach their kids things like math and, sci and the, you know, the sciences and how to read, you know, at that basic level of kindergarten, and then they go in and this sort of issue is being discussed and it goes against the parent's value. I think they should eat an entire turd. I don't care. Fuck them. I, I, I yeah. genuinely don't, like, I, what, the, what you're essentially arguing for is, like, the right for the parent to make society worse. Like, you're, the parents are paying taxes, so shouldn't they then, by way of those taxes, have the right to worsen the lives of people around them through bigoted fear-mongering by excising the um, apparent existence of a minority group from education because they're too much of a pussy to just raise their child right to begin with? Um, to which I have no respect for these people whatsoever. I don't even think they should be allowed to have children. If I, if you, you could get me on a far right bent, if I could be some kind of radical eugenicist, but it would be taking away the right for, um, for, for people to have children. If they end up being the type of parent who would complain about a school teaching their kids about gay or trans people, that would be my, that's like my far right uber fascist, uh, <laughs> horseshoe theory position. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. I mean, this stuff, I, I is, think from, this stuff is dangerous, you know. All the stuff you're playing with right now is the stuff that was done in the Weimar Republic by the Nazis when they started setting up their specific education. It was done by the, um, uh, the Stalinists as well. You start with making pleas towards moral indignity. Um, what children should or should not be exposed to. What kind of information is inimitable to the public will. Um, but as we've already seen in Florida, and this isn't a slippery slope argument, Florida's already gone past this point. Right now in Florida, millions of books have been taken from school shelves and taken over to the state so they can review and provide a government-approved whitelist of degeneracy-free media um, uh, for the children to look at. We're already at that point. It's not a slippery slope thing, you know? Yeah, I, I do think that... You're, yeah, I mean, I, I just, I've not thought of it about the way of... The connections to history with the civil rights movement before because the integration of public schools is an issue that i've actually researched a lot because of how much it impacted you know the state that we're in today with kids you know growing up with other kids from other races has made the whole like whole country a lot more tolerant and i guess when you apply that to this issue I would say that in the cases that you're describing, I, mean, I don't really disagree. To be, yeah. Uh, oh, nice. It looks um, like we really did end up having the same thought process on this issue, huh? I guess so. I mean, when you think about it from the racial perspective rather than the gender perspective, though, and I, I do want to bring this up because that's the one that's being targeted by, I'm sure you're familiar with him, Governor Yunkin in my home state. Um, you know, 
public schools were paying money to bring in, I think you're pretty familiar with Abram X. Kendi? Yes. Yeah. Public schools were paying him in Virginia to come in and give, you know, talks. Is that something that you would also believe is okay? Well, sure. Um, schools paying, uh, using public money in order to get speakers is pretty common. I had, uh, when I was in middle school, there were some motivational speakers who came by and spoke. I mean, I think there was one guy who was like a quadriplegic, but he like did a speech on how like life is still good no matter what obstacles you face as long as you have the right attitude. I think there were a couple of people sure. like that, you know? And they probably had to pay for that. Yeah, I'd say they probably did. But when you think when you bring it into this perspective where Abraham X. Kendi is basically teaching that white people are inherently racist, would you say that's accurate that that's one of the things he believes? Well, did he say that in the speech? Well, I wasn't there, but well, that is something that he's written about. He he's written on a lot of stuff. Um, so a lot the, the a lot of the BLM affiliate woke whatever writers I have some issues with um, vis-a-vis -vis essentialism. A lot of Ibram X. Kendi's writings that come across that way are mostly on the idea that like there are social forces that guide white people towards racism by virtue of their skin color. And that it's a pretty like inexorable process. Like you can be moved from it, but those forces are like a a a, a heavy weight no matter what, which is true. Um, I just think sometimes the way he phrases it, oftentimes kind of like um, deliberately it, like an, it, evocative to get attention. I, I disagree with him doing that. I think these issues are sensitive enough that he should be a bit more considerate. But I don't have an issue with him like talking to kids or whatever. Sure, but I think the premise of it was that he was talking to them on that sort of issue where he said, you know, white people are inherently racist because of the way that they are brought up in society. And then what happens is, you know, his books are in the libraries, again, for very young ages, and the teachers are regurgitating some of that to classes. At that point, would you say that that's no longer something that we should have in public schools? Um... I mean, I don't, I don't think that's what that's what happened here. So I think we're kind of constructing a separate theoretical situation, right? Because you said you don't can... know the content of the speech. I doubt he like went up to a bunch of kindergartners and he was like, um, "Yeah, white people are inherently racist." However, like biting the bullet, then if he did say that, like if if we ignore all the specifics and we just go like, okay, well hypothetically, if he did say that, um, I think that like teachers uh, or, or or parents could have a right to complain about it. But I don't think that would then necessitate legislation. There's this really authoritarian bent on the right lately where you have these like inconveniences and these like uh, inequities that have existed for centuries and we've had systems to deal with it. But now Republicans act like they're totally new and we need like legislation from the state like like this issue. We, we, we have no choice but to invoke the full power of the law to fix it. And what you just discussed right there is like maybe they had like a bad speaker come by. Like what? What's the solution on that? A state, um, like, uh, panel to to like verify the political alignment of everyone who wants to speak at a at a school. Like, a, any solution here causes more problems than it fixes, right? Sure, but the issue isn't the fact that they brought in the speakers; that those same ideas were then regurgitated in the classroom to the young ages, and it's it's ultimately the same as the transgender thing, except in this case. I mean, I, I certainly don't believe all white people are racist. Um, so in this case, no, no, no. it would be, from my perspective, not truthful and not the... Yeah, but you can't have, yeah. you can't have legislation yeah. saying you can never have anything not truthful in schools. Because if you did that, it would be unenforceable and oh. insane. And every courtroom in, in, the, in the country would immediately be bogged down with eight trillion cases of like parents clipping little microphones onto their kids and then like the teacher says one thing they disagree with and they instantly go to court like what's the solution oh, yeah, but, well I'm, I'm thinking i'm thinking of the specific case so would you say that banning the teachings of abram x kendi to elementary schoolers is something that would be fair no we don't need legislation to ban specific authors from being taught well, okay yeah, we don't we don't authors. do like the it's like all the, the ideas that he no we don't do writes. that either there's like all these tenets of a free society that i appreciate that you don't seem to 
the kinds of governments that go around passing legislation to ban, politicize uh, elements of the curriculum are authoritarian. What you're talking about is authoritarianism right here. Like, the free liberal democratic governments aren't like, you know, hmm, I disagree with this one thing one speaker said while talking to this one group of, of school students. So let's pass nationwide legislation to ban a whole ideology. Like, you understand, like, this is, like, really dangerous stuff that you're just casually invoking. Like, like I'm on the subway and some guy kind of shuffles by me really rude and I'm like, that's it. That's it. We need federal legislation to completely ban people from shoulder checking me specifically on the subway. You know, it's very dangerous territory. Not like the ideas behind it, because you said that public schools should exist. We are agreed already that public schools should exist to promote the public good with the concession of the previous don't say gay stuff, which is what I did. Yeah, but so schools should teach what is right, right? So then if we go on the premise that this sort of stuff that from Abram X. Kendi doesn't fit that description, would it not be unfair to say teachers should not be teaching that? You can say teachers should not be teaching that, but I don't think teachers should be teaching capitalism. So if we want to really go by the empirical dictates of educational curriculum, then I would start busting out like Marx and talking about how I actually think teachers should be let go of their jobs for teaching about like, uh, like, like supply side economics or whatever. Um, I, I might discourage the teaching of some things in schools. I might not like it, but I don't think you should pass legislation because when politicians meddle in educational curriculum, the outcome is always bad. And I mean always. You can seriously look at the history of stuff like this being done and you will find that it is overwhelmingly uh, the prerogative of authoritarian governments to interfere in this way. Um, it, it just doesn't solve the issues they claim it'll solve, you know? Yeah, so I basically, I just... So, so in theory, they shouldn't be teaching those sort of things from, you know, Abram X. Kendi, the all white people are racist sort of narrative, but they shouldn't ban it. So what should we do about if there was, and again, we're going into theoretical because I, I think this is happening with some teachers in some schools. But sure. if we were in a situation where a lot of teachers were teaching that, what would be the solution? I think public pressure. Keep in mind that the lost cause myth, the idea that the North started the Civil War and that it was over states' rights rather than slavery, is taught in not just individual classrooms, but entire states. There are whole states in America where you can reliably expect to be taught a pro-Confederacy, white supremacist myth about American history, but I've never proposed it should be made illegal to do so. And the reason for that is because I just don't think it's a good solution. I think you can protest, uh, you can mark cultural shifts, you can make an effort to have the curriculum change based on who you vote for in the, uh, in the school board, based on uh, what values you prioritize when you talk at town hall meetings or what you teach your kids and how they speak up in classrooms. But I don't think that, um, I don't think it's appropriate to just like bring out the, the legislation hammer, you know? Yeah, and I definitely, I'm very, you know, as a fundamental part of my, principles politically is anti-authoritarian, but I, the difference is between banning speech and books in general and banning speech and books in schools to kindergartners. But that, that, is what, that is what it is. That's what authoritarians do first. The first thing they do is they target what the students learn. And then they raise a generation of people indoctrinated on a specific set of ideologies they politicized and then they have enough support to go about with their broad. This is like Hitler, like the Hitler Jugend. That, like, that sounds like slippery slope to me. But, but it's it's not slippery slope. It's what happens. It's what they do. There's no reason to be authoritarian with any of these school curriculums. Just no good is done from it. Well, I mean, okay. Would you, if a teacher was teaching like Holocaust denial, we've already established that that shouldn't be allowed because it's bad yeah it's because it's bad so in that case if all teachers were teaching holocaust denial would we ban teaching holocaust denial if um i would certainly want to have it removed from the curriculum uh the issue is in a, in a situation where like all teachers are teaching holocaust denial that would suggest we live in such a radically far-right society 
that I, I don't even know what like the path forward would be there. If we if we were in a system where the curriculum and all the educators were Holocaust deniers, that would suggest to me you'd need more radical uh, action to be taken to fix those issues. Under those circumstances, I might be okay with something more legislative. Um, well, but teachers that... are overwhelmingly like leftist as a fact, and the state of Florida is not. So when you look at the state of Florida, it feels like the same sort of situation to them. Except, where... wait, 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 hold on. The to them because holocaust denial is bad and teaching children that gay and trans people exist and are fine is good so i don't care what it feels like to them they can bite it they can walk into the ocean lord knows they have enough coastline to do it from um what i care about is what's actually right and wrong okay and i think that if that's the perspective that's a that's a fair perspective but it's the only perspective all matters of curriculum uh, and education ultimately come down to moral values. Um, even whether or not you teach something empirical, like whether or not you put it in the curriculum, that's a matter of whether or not you prioritize it. You could have a factual curriculum that doesn't include uh, the civil rights movement, after all. It wouldn't be factually inaccurate to leave it out, would it? I mean, it would just be missing that. But our curriculum misses lots of stuff. It can't teach everything, right? I mean, if you have to talk about, if the assumption is that you have to talk about controversial things in elementary school, which I, I guess that's accurate, then sure. I just think that controversy, controversy in general should be avoided in an elementary school as much as possible. Well, unfor that's, unfortunately, that's just not the world we live in when conservatives are making moral panics out of things, right? They will make values controversial so they can use that controversy to justify uh, their opposition. That's what they did with creationism, right? Teach the controversy. They created a controversy around creationism out of whole cloth. And then because they created it, they were like, ah, well, see how controversial this issue is? I guess we can't teach it to kids. I mean, who knows what the right position is? Look at all this propaganda we made, you know? Creationism is a good example, because I remember learning about the creationism versus, um, excuse me, creationism versus evolution debate. And I think that the teacher my way handled that, uh, the way that my teacher handled that at the time was absolutely phenomenal. He was religious personally, and he said that, but then he said that he, he explained evolution fully and creationism fully and said people have varying opinions on this. That's a bad and, way of teaching it. Why? Because there's not a there's not two right answers. There's a right and a wrong answer. He he did you a disservice there. Like, like that was that was bad. He equated the, like a right and a wrong issue right there. Like this would be like this would be like um like heliocentrist debates or whatever. Where it's like, well, some people say the solar system revolves around the Earth, and some say that it revolves around the Sun, and it'll be up to you to decide. No, it won't. You're a teacher. Tell me the truth. And the truth here is, of course, um, you know. The, the truth to him would have been creationism because he was personally religious. Then he would have been wrong. And because he was personally biased, he politicized your education by lying to you implicitly by suggesting there was a real debate between these issues. If he you know, were to teach that sort of creation, if he were to teach creationism, then, well, okay, let me rephrase this actually. In that sort of, like, Okay, let's just say, and I understand, I'm thinking, I just, I like to think about these issues from perspectives, right? Like, from his perspective, if he teaches about, okay, you're, if you're forcing him to teach that evolution is the truth and the only way to do it, then how would he be able to, I, I don't know, I don't, he wouldn't be able to do that, is what I'm trying to get at. You're trying to tell a creationist person to teach evolution. Well, then, if he can't do but, his job, he should quit. Okay. Like, the, well, the pro like, yes, his personal values here are just wrong. Um, he'll have to suck that up for this one. Uh, you know, it, it, like his, his personal values shouldn't corrupt the education of his students. Yes, I mean, from my personal perspective in life, I... I'm, a, I'm an agnostic person, so I don't know whether creationism is real or not. So from my perspective, he handled it perfectly. But uh, from your perspective, no, I can no, understand no. why from, that's right. From your perspective, he handled it improperly. Because even if you're agnostic, yeah. ag agnosticism just means that you don't know whether or not there's a deity. But there's still an evidentiary standard that has to be met here. 
the evidence for evolution is overwhelming and omnipresent. It's all around us all the time. It is overwhelming and unavoidable. The evidence oh. for creationism doesn't exist. Much in the same way that, you know, you might be agnostic on the existence of unicorns, but if a teacher was to tell you that, uh, you know, some people say there are horses, some people say there are unicorns, no one can really say, that would still be a wrong statement because he's equating um, uh, uh, an issue for which we have lots of evidence and an issue for which we have none. I, I mean, sure, yeah. From the perspective of creationism, sorry, excuse me, evolution is the only possible answer, then you'd be right. You'd be doing me a disservice to teach it as a debate. Well, evolution yeah. is the only answer here. Creationism isn't. Do you want to talk about that? Are you a creationist? I, mean, I could get into that, but that's not what we're discussing. No, I think we certainly can, because I'm kind of curious yeah. as to why you seem to respect the opinions of objectively wrong people so much. Normally, I just try to ignore them, or at least understand why they are why they are. Um, what what issue what what equation is there on this then on on um on evolution and creationism okay sure so i think that when you go that far back into history we we're talking about the creation of life the big bang we don't know what happened and if you look at the science we have proof that humans evolved from monkeys but we don't have proof of how life started yeah, nobody has and proof going that far back, but the exactly. point of, the point of evolution Welcome is Welcome to just, agnosticism. Yeah, but the point of evolution, the theory of evolution doesn't purport to explain the origins of the universe. It only purports to explain the systems by which creatures evolve, which it does correctly. Um whereas creationism argues not that. Creationists don't think evolution happened. They don't think humans evolved from monkeys or anything like that. Um they think that all is as it was uh from about 6000 years ago. And the the events of the Bible may or may not have taken place, depending on the type of creationist. And now we're here. I mean, agnosticism doesn't define a particular religion. It's not Christian, obviously. So, I mean, when you look at agnosticism, what it says is it says there could be a God. And the God could have created the universe and set into place the rules that we now, the physical rules that we now live under, which would include evolution. That's, I mean, that's not the including evolution part is my perspective, not necessarily the baseline agnostic, but I think you know what I mean. But that's not the creationist perspective. Creationists don't say, th so what you're referring to here is the, um, the watchmaker model, uh, the idea that evolution and God coexist because God created the systems for evolution. Uh, you know, the, all, everything that evolutionary theorists and scientists say is correct, just that, you know, it all got set in motion by God. This is a non-falsifiable position. I can't disprove the existence of God. Um, but the evolutionary theory would still be correct under that system. Um, whereas the creationist line of thinking is, is, is incoherent at, at best. Um, the idea that 6,000 years ago we were all as we are now and evolutionary processes can't take place because all species are locked innately into their existing genetic code. Um, it's it's provably wrong, even within the short time frame we've been doing this research. I mean, we've seen evolutionary changes to dog breeds in, in just decades of time, um, it, which, which is enough to prove evolution on its own. I mean, not notwithstanding a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, I, I definitely believe evolution happened. I guess, are you defining creationism as humans were created 6,000 years ago, exactly the script you just gave, no change whatsoever, or are you defining creationism as there is a God who created the universe? No, no. For them, creationism is the alternative to evolution. When that teacher equated okay. evolution and creationism, that's because he didn't believe in evolution. You earlier acknowledged that because you said, I don't know how somebody who's a creationist could teach evolution. So you know there's a contradiction there. So uh, creationism must necessarily then refer to, um, to, to an ideology which, which excludes evolution. Okay, I guess that's fair. Well, so I, we're just talking about, I'm honestly just asking questions at this point because I'm not sure about the exact definitions. What would you call, I mean, I, I, I think I'm agnostic if I say I believe that God may have created the universe or there may have been some sort of scientific miraculous event and then from there, evolution happened, and here we are. Is that, that that's agnosticism by my definition? Is that not by yours? Um, I think there's enough variability there that you could probably get away with that definition. Sure, 
I'm okay. I'm just I'm just Fair concerned enough. with the, like the state of our public education. You know, I don't really. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I know we got off on a tangent. Well, what you know, whatever you prefer to believe, there is 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 fine by me. But I definitely think that teacher did you dirty. You know, um, there was a right answer and there was a wrong answer, and they thought about it and they decided that their own biases, their political bias on the issue, um, gave them the right to to give their classroom a a worse understanding of the issue which I, I think is despicable and also actual like politicization of um of of the classroom you know in, in a way that i would disagree with and he actually like there's just enough people i, I don't know about a majority i was about to say majority but i don't think that's true there's enough people that believe in creationism that it should probably be taught as a perspective no it shouldn't it's wrong no, okay why would we teach it's wrong something by our perspective? But we could be wrong. No, no, no. I it's mean... just wrong. It's not wrong by our perspective. It's wrong by an empiricist perspective. If you believe in anti-empiricism, then you can all go eat dirt if you want. I don't know because you, because empirical evidence may suggest dirt's bad for you, but you're not going to let that get in your way. Um, it's it's not correct. I don't understand. Why do you respect the opinion of people who are wrong so much? The whole point of people being wrong is to correct them. The whole. The whole, the whole process of civilization is the refinement of bad ideas into good ones. But in order for that process to succeed, bad ideas have to be socially deprioritized. You're arguing for the opposite. I feel like we would have stalled out somewhere around the Euphrates. Like, we would have stalled out before even inventing bread um, if we were to go by your system here. Because it would, it would, it would mean we wouldn't, it's like... You know, well, we have we have the, the 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 village elder Carl and the village elder Sheen, and Sheen's ideas keep working, and Carl's don't. But a lot of people believe Carl, so we're just going to keep teaching those. And then yeah, they all I died. Guess, I'll go back to the first thing you said, which is why do you respect the opinions of like people who are wrong? And I would say it's because I don't think I'm right on everything. I mean, when you look at the conversation we just had i mean i've now I, I i can safely say now that i don't think the don't say gay bill is a good decision i don't think fel felonies putting you know teachers in prison for mentioning that is a good thing i was wrong on that point because i have but i didn't even think, know the felony part to be 100 percent honest with you so i don't think i'm right on everything and so i think that it's fair to teach multiple perspectives yeah, but the only reason that you changed your mind on that was because you were educated by a person with an empiricist worldview. If I treated all ideas equally, uh, then I would have never been able to correct you on that one. Like, it, it, there, you can still have your opinion on the issue. Yeah, but opinions are worthless unless substantiated. Um, like, everyone has, there are lots of dumb opinions on issues, but that's not enough. Like. The, you know, it's it's good to have an open mind on this, but at the end of the day, you have to be willing to take like a determinative stance and say, okay, you know, uh, I might not be right on anything, but God damn it, I think I'm right on this and I'm putting my foot down. And then you can defend it, you know, however you want. But as as it stands right now, it seems like your like scope of open mindedness is wide enough to include people who have no evidence for their beliefs, which if that's the case, then like, what's even the point? I'd say the point, as far as education goes, is to teach opinions that are widely, like, disputed. The idea that germ theory like, isn't real? That was controversial back in its day. Should we be teaching both sides on that? I mean, I don't know. Back in that time, if that was taught, would that have created a substantial amount of, you know, would that, would that have changed that it was later adopted in the future? I mean, Probably not, because well, as evidence farther came along, everyone adopted germ theory as true. Yeah, but that's because we taught it and pushed for it. Like, the, the idea that you should wash your hands before doing anything medically involved has saved more lives than any other medical decision ever made ever in all of human history. It was more of a lifesaver than basically any vaccine. It was critical. It, it, it revolutionized medicine. And it was because of germ theory because they realized the stuff on their hands that were killing people were small enough that they couldn't see them. But if, but it was controversial at the time, because think of how that sounds to your layperson. Like, oh, sickness happens because there are tiny creatures that are invisible on my hands, and you can kill them with hot water? <laughs> A lot of people didn't believe it. But in spite of that, like, higher education pushed for it, 
And as a product of that, you know, millions of people who might otherwise be dead now get to be alive. Probably including you and me, because, you know, the, the childhood mortality rate back then, the pre-germ theory era, was uh, um, uninspiring, to say the least, you know? Yeah. And I think one of the crucial things you said, though, there was higher education push for it. Well, in lower Ooh. education, we still teach our kids today to wash their hands after they use the restroom. I think it would have been okay to do the same back then with those young kids. Yeah, but okay. Let's say that in the theoretical world when germ theory was more, you know, more fitting of the word theory, not something that was empirically proven. No, it was empirically if, proven like, back then. Like instantly, it was instantly empirically proven as soon as it was starting to be taught. No, no, no. By by That's the cool. time it was the subject of like public uh, uh of of like public discourse where people were being taught to start washing your hands like frequently, um, it had already been proven. I, I think they'd already done like a number of tests involving petri dishes and like the the growth of um enzymes and bacteria on culture that had not like had contact with the environment except for a small sample from the hand, something like that. They they had effectively proved the theory. But it was still controversial because keep in mind, we're talking like the early 1800s. A lot of people's idea back then, early, mid 1800s, a lot of people's ideas of hygiene back then was like spit into your hands and give them a rub and you're good to go. Um, it, it took a lot of work to educate people out of that mindset. Yeah, and that, this is definitely not an example that befits the point that I'm about to make. So I'll make it without an example. What if something were taught? Because, you know, we all know that empirically proven things can change. You know, science can change with the scientific method. Theories that we have thought to be true for a substantial period of time have then, through the scientific method, changed. If we teach something from a perspective of it being the universal truth, and then it turns out not to be true, and there was a substantial portion of people that disagreed with that theory throughout the entire time, and we're trying to stop it from being taught in schools who would have been right in the end. Like these sort of things can change. I know we're deviating quite a lot here. Yeah, but keep but in, do, do you understand what I'm saying? Keep in mind that it, while it is often true that things accepted to be true are then later proven false, the thing that ends up getting proven false is still usually better than the previously accepted idea. So Newtonian physics are incorrect. They're mathematically wrong, um, but they were a useful model. I mean, so useful that they could predict the orbit of stars. Um, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And they're still used today for a lot of conventional calculations. People don't bust out like Einstein's equations on relativity when they're trying to work out distances within a city, for example, um, or, or some basic like astronomical stuff. So even if things can change, even if things believed to be right can end up being wrong, the thing that might be wrong in the future is still better than what's being done today, right? The only concern would be if this new thing being taught is worse than the previous iteration, which is why my standard for adoption is basically just, I don't actually really care whether it's true. I care whether it's more true than what was being taught before, because that's the only thing you really can prove, you know? Sure, but is that universally the case where the thing that is being taught is better than the thing previously being taught? No, which is why we don't often teach new ideas, right? They do, like, for instance, string theory. Um, string theory doesn't get like auto taught in all um, physics courses in college, even though it's like been around for a while, it hasn't demonstrated itself to be worthwhile enough. Um, there are sociological theories that don't really get much airing until higher level soap classes. There are historical uh, interpretations that get left out of like young, like younger classrooms or, or altogether. Um, this happens all the time. But if you can make a good argument for one idea being better than another, even if we can't prove that either of them are empirically, objectively true, then I still think that's, you know. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a fair perspective on it. As long as what is being taught is actually better, in terms of, I mean, we're talking about scientific things now, but it, it, as long as it is objectively better, as in germ theory, and yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Vaccines are a big one, too. The uh, initial oh, yeah. rollout of vaccines was met with quite a bit, quite a bit of skepticism. I mean, obviously, we're still seeing that today, but um, the small pack, the smallpox vaccine saved like an oh. incalculable number of lives. So. I thought you were going into COVID vaccines with smallpox too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, COVID vaccines have also saved lives. Um, not as much as smallpox. Yes. Smallpox vaccines are uh, uh, it was a pretty big deal, you know. But there were anti-vaxxers back then. Oh, I'm sure there were. I'm actually there might have been logically think about it. I think you'd think there'd be more, but there might be more now, regardless. I don't know. 
you know there was but, um i think there was uh uh th there was more like a, a like of an evidentiary thing going on back then i think mm -hmm. you know about the spanish flu after world war one killed 20 million people wrapped around the world i know the basics yeah uh there was a big parade happening in new york city um a little while after World War One, sometime during which the, the virus was making its way around. It had just been reintroduced into New York City. Some public officials told him, hey, don't have this big parade. Because back in the day, you know, parades were the talk of the town. Everyone Absolutely. shows up at the parade. and Everyone loves a good parade. Oh, yeah. And they, um, well, they showed up by the thousands. And it ended up creating kind of a pathologic situation in New York City for a while after that. There were corpses in the street. They literally had a... They had corpse piles that were on some street corners. Um, so many people got so sick so quickly. The hospitals overfilled. The hospitals uh, weren't capable of holding that many people. So they got sick in there too and people overcrowded. And, you know, it was literally like uh, corpse wagons. I'm um, being told from chat it was Philadelphia, not New York. Sorry, my bad. But yeah, it was, okay. it was pretty bad. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I would not have made, been able to make that correction. But yeah, that makes sense. Uh... You know, when you look at, talk about science changing, though, I mean, you just look at the COVID vaccine rollout in this recent year. I mean, I already told you I got the vaccine. I'm relatively pro-vaccine. I think that it helped. But initially, they said, if you get the vaccine, you can't get the virus. That was something that Fauci said and very quickly was proven to not be the case. And obviously, I'm, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, but I think I got the vaccine, but... There were a couple. I would of... say that's an example of it changing. Where it would have been nice. I, it, schools weren't really teaching it, but it would have been nice to say that's not. You know, that's worse than there, what was the later truth. There were a couple of spurious instances of some people being very enthusiastic about the efficacy of the vaccine, but the overall messaging um, on the the COVID vaccine has been really, really consistent. Like, like people like to focus on a couple of sound bites, maybe especially like, like every once in a while, there'd be like a, like a CNN commentator who will run off at the mouth a little bit, but overwhelmingly, like the, the message from the CDC and stuff has been, you know, this will reduce the viral load. It'll make you less likely to catch it. It'll make you less likely to spread it. Um, and it'll make you, um, it'll make it more survivable. You'll, you'll, um, you'll, you'll not suffer the same consequences as if a person had not gotten the vaccine. And the evidence demonstrates all that, you know, when you're talking about something okay. as big as COVID, like hundreds of thousands of people offering their opinions on this, you're probably going to get a couple of instances of, um, of, of like over enthusiastic support. But overall, I think the messaging has been pretty good, right? It's been pretty honest. Well, early on, I don't think it was early on. You can find CDC statements. You can find Dr. Fauci on CNN and various other NHS video, whatever, saying that it's 100 percent effect effective. It's 90 percent effective. You know, it completely stops transmission. And then that changed very quickly. And I, I don't think he was necessarily I don't think he had any malintent in that. I think that's just what he was being told. And that's what he thought was the case. And then that turned out to not be the case. And they updated it, which I think is completely fair. But that is a situation where it would have been nice to initially say it's 40% effective, 50% effective, whatever it actually is, rather than, you know, saying that it's 100%. And if that ended up being extended over a period of 10 years, schools would have been teaching, hey, it's 100% effective. Yeah, but that didn't really happen. I, I man, I remember back... Okay, I don't have the memory for this because I know if I like dig through it, we're talking like multiple years of shit. But my memory of the early bits of the COVID pandemic were the CDC saying like, okay, based on the information that we have, like this is something like 96. I think the highest number that I saw was 98 that was substantiated and eventually leveled out with the Pfizer one to like 94 or something like that. Um, I don't, I really don't remember people saying like 100% effective. There might've been a couple of sound clips where, where like uh, somebody exasperatedly says like, if you get this, you'll be fine, guaranteed or something like that, which I, I agree is kind of irresponsible, I guess. But we're talking like 99.999% was responsible messaging. I don't know if it's possible to do better than that um, with so many people getting involved, right? Yeah, um, I did just pull up where Dr. Fauci said in a video it was like 94 to 95% effective. So yeah, it wasn't 100 yeah, because that, that, be that's true. The original, with the original uh, Pfizer vaccine against the original strain of COVID alpha, that was accurate. 
And then of course we had we had we had Delta and, and now we have Omicron and now we have God knows what we're dealing with right now, but you know. I guess that could be the case, but it was, it was so that, true. that's why it got less effective. Okay. Yeah, because because it's it's difficult. Uh, the vaccines don't work that well against strains that aren't the one they were targeted for initially. The um, sure. evolutionary potential of COVID seems to be its its worst trait, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's the case as well. The yeah, the science definitely changed with the vaccine in a fair way. Well, the evidence that, changes the, too, right? I mean, evidence, that can't that can't that can't be helped. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that and I was just trying to make a broader point about that with how things that seem to be true at one point can turn out to not be true. Yeah, sure. So we have to make and like that's, a, a reasoned case on like whether it's better to have the idea or not at all, right? So like for COVID vaccines, even if they thought it was originally 95% effective, but then it turned out like, oh, actually it's only like 80% effective. It's still better for people to get the vaccine than not, you know? Even if they were wrong about the effectiveness, like even if they ended up being like super off, um, it's always better to get them to have the vaccine. So you want to um, incentivize the uh, the best possible behavior. Yeah, and I've I've always said you know, incentivize getting the vaccine, but there could be situations where that's not the case, and it could be worse than that people, in this case, got the vaccine, or in any other case, it could be worse that the truth was that that, that sorry that the opposite was true of what was thought was true. And at that point, I mean, just tying it back into education, that's why you just have to be careful what is taught. Well, I agree. In terms of, okay. But I'm not promoting the teaching of anything particularly controversial or radical. I would, yeah. Sorry, okay. I, when I say controversial, I mean controversial in its truth value, not controversial in its political acceptance. Yeah, um, I took what you meant because I know what your yes, uh, approach yeah. is on that from previously. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't think the, you know, I don't think anyone's come out with a uh, robust scientific counterproof to gay people exist and are okay. Um, if they do, I'll probably hear about it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, unless you have anything else that you wanted to talk about, I really appreciate talking to you about the. Don't say gay bill and the various other broader issues with education. I'm definitely going to take a lot from it. Uh, was there, was there anything else that you said I wanted to discuss? Or well, I have the memory of a goldfish, so I don't actually remember the stuff you specifically laid out in the email. But if there was something else that I've said you disagree with, I'd be more than happy to continue talking. I can pull up my email right now. I mean, I think. What are go ahead? Oh no, I just I I genuinely do think you have a good head about a lot of this. I just think um what's that term? Or like that phrase. The um don't um you know, make sure your mind's not too open or your brain falls out. I, you're 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 very accepting of ideas that I consider to be indefensible. But um, It's funny that you say that because that's the that exact quote has been quoted to me by conservatives about leftist positions. So uh, well, um, horseshoe theory again, I, I guess it's, it's not, it's not like, it, it, it's not like, a, an, an indictment of intelligence or anything. It's just, I, I see people sometimes they're, they're very stuck on the idea that it's, um, it's not possible to make these definitive claims, you know, or like it's dangerous to the concern I have though, is you say you're anti-authoritarian, honest to God, I believe you, but I think that the right is very effective at using pleas towards moderation and towards like open discourse and dialogue as ways of paving the road towards like annihilation effectively. And it, it, it means that even if you're anti-authoritarian ideologically, politically, um, you end up serving their interests. And that would be my concern here, right? Sure. And I can understand that. I really don't think that the American right is that authoritarian. I mean, when you hear the campaign messages of right-wing politicians and the fundamental, you know, well, what they pass as well. I mean, it's about lowering the size of small, well, making the government smaller in terms of spending. You know, you don't hear about any of that on the leftist side, the democratic side. So they don't really do that, though. And I'd say they do. I mean, they vote when for you the look exact at the same states of military budget, uh, the only stuff they really want to deregulate is uh, like Wall Street 
regulation and um, like EPA regulation. So their oil and gas cronies can continue to pollute the environment, and make lots of money. Outside of that, they don't really ever challenge like the state um, like at all, um, really. But in terms of a, in terms of authoritarianism, like it's getting really bad out there. Donald Trump literally said that we should suspend the Constitution and make him leader, like, now. Uh, Ron DeSantis recently said that for death penalty trials, you shouldn't need all 12 jurors. Only 8 out of 12 should be necessary to sentence a person to death. The prevailing conservative constitutional interpretation doctrine is shifting over towards uh, paternalistic constitutionalism, which is essentially, and there have been articles on this, the idea that the Constitution's writings are irrelevant, and you should just interpret it in whatever way allows you to get your political agenda done. Uh, when Barr, a, a general attorney Barr, was in charge back under Trump, he tried to use sedition charges to uh, do mass arrests of um, uh, BLM protesters, which would have numbered in the tens or hundreds of thousands of people being charged with sedition there. Donald Trump just today put out a little blurb, which I saw a section of on Twitter, in which he said that he wanted to defund any hospitals which in any way um, uh, 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 you know, provided trans health care, and that he wanted to get rid of Biden's guidelines on trans health care's accessibility to Medicare and Medicaid. Like, the, everything, like the, the, on every line, everything they do and say is, we will use the state to punish you. Um, there's like, there's not a hint of anti-authoritarianism to their messaging outside of like, yeah, we'll defund the government, which they never do. They, they never actually do that, you know? Well, I'll start here. First off, Trump is obviously authoritarian. I, I'm not a Trump supporter in any way, shape, or form. But in terms of the broader right-wing, you know, conservative positions, I mean, I, the rights that I consider fundamental to anti-authoritarianism are all positions that are held very strongly by the right and at best very weakly by the left like what and i'll give i'll get yeah i was gonna i was gonna say i'll give an example here i'd say the right to freedom of speech is wait, something wait. that you'll talk you'll hear conservative like yeah you know, pundits at, hold as core values while you'll see the left at least flirt with the idea of banning hate speech and so, that sort of thing so this is what i mean when i say like you're vulnerable to their rhetoric Donald Trump wanted to open up libel and slander laws so he could sue newspapers for reporting accurately on the stuff that he said. Um, we, are, we literally just had a discussion about teachers facing felony charges if they didn't submit their, their school curriculums to a state whitelist. Um, freedom of speech involves stuff said in the classroom, too. That's where speech is often most important, after all, because the purpose of speech is to influence other people. Education is a big part of that. Um, <clears throat> conservatives are incredibly pro cop. They were anti BLM. Yes. Um, they're anti like public demonstration broadly. They have a tendency to uh, uh, work off on that when they can. You know, like these protesters are all anti American thugs, that kind of stuff. Um, they uh, only when they are I'm kidding. Right. Well, they but like they regardless of what they say, you you realize that when um. When they talk about being pro freedom of speech, what they're really talking about is like let these Nazis back on Twitter, right? In what meaningful like legislative ways um, are they pro freedom of speech? When you look at the attempts, the bills that are attempting to curtail freedom of speech, where my mind goes is like what hate speech laws. What, That's the number. What That's hate speech laws? I'm not, I'm, I don't follow Congress closely enough to know about every proposed bill, but I think we can agree that it's a commonly proposed idea on the left. No, you have heard that no. from conservatives. There is, there is literally no um, fronted, politically supported hate speech bill that's been pushed on a federal level, and I'm unaware of any on a state level. It's a major push within the left, though. No, I, I like, I, I've heard. I'm, you've heard. Are friends that are leftists. You've that heard from leftists. It's, it's, this isn't a real thing. The, the things I just said about the Republicans okay. are being done by their people in power. There is no push right now for hate speech laws. There just isn't. I mean, yeah, again, I'm not going to go into defending Trump because I never would support him, but the for a lot of reasons, and that includes prior to, you know, the election fraud stuff, which, yeah, anyway. 
Yeah, so AOC did push for hate speech laws. She uh, tweeted about it, which is a very minor form of pushing. Well, what's the sentiment is. <sighs> Just keep keep in mind, we're comparing this, this to we're comparing this right now to like Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis are both active authoritarians and they're the two presidential candidates for the GOP. So whatever we're so in terms of like anti free speech, you have to remember you have to come up with something better than the leaders of the GOP are authoritarians who completely disrespect democracy and don't care about freedom. Like it's a very high bar to pass. It's also sure. not one you'll be able to pass. I mean, you can look stuff up, but like, if I knew, I knew, right? It's, it's a pretty tough line. Yeah, I mean, AOC did tweet saying, you know, for, for those who believe in free speech, whose free speech do you believe in? Because some folks using speech to defend racism are also supporting folks, you know. Yeah, so that's like, true. A lot. Usually, what like what Republicans will do is they won't actively defend racism or Nazism. They'll defend the free speech to say it. Um, this is like a really common thing. If you take a look at like, so this is really funny, and I know this because this happened like right around the time I started my channel. Okay, all of the neo Nazis and alt writers online. I'm talking about like large accounts, small accounts, a ton of people, a ton, a ton, a ton of people. Okay, all these people, these people, they want to gas the Jews. They want to kill all the black and brown people in the country. They're full on far right. And then all of a sudden, all of these guys, Richard Spencer, Nick Fuentes, they all become free speech warriors. All of them out of nowhere are like, yeah, we are very concerned with the anti-free speech. Keep in mind, these people are all advocating politically for the opposite of free speech. They want the furthest form of authoritarianism possible by a government. But all of a sudden, they're, they're free speech warriors. And the reason for that was because they identified correctly that there was an avenue they could exploit. The conservative uh, bias of like, you know, we won't defend the idea, we'll just defend your right to say it and not do the same thing when the left wing has something that I disagree with that I want to say. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I mean, certainly in the case of like Nick Fuentes and all that, but I've got a question. Would you support the right of, right of free speech for those same people you described, the people you know, Nazis, basically. I support their First Amendment rights, absolutely. I don't think they should be arrested for saying what they say. Okay, well, in that case, we definitely agree, but I think there are a lot on the left that who would not support that. I just who would I, say we just, need hate speech laws. Even, even if the left was successful in pushing something like that, an anti-hate speech law that targeted neo-Nazis is so much better than all the stuff on the right that actually has happened. We're right now we're like comparing a hypothetical, maybe kind of bad thing to an actual currently developing encroach of fascism. You know, there's such a big difference. Yeah, I mean, there's not an active hate speech law on the books in America, but there certainly is in Canada. There's a bill that quote prohibits willful willful promotion promotion of hatred and the public incitement of hatred. Okay, which a... would violate the First Amendment, and I think that. But it's not a it, far reach to say the American left would support the same thing. It's Canada. They don't have a First Amendment. But yeah, that, that is true. But okay, I try, you wanted an example of on the books, and there I don't think there is a proposed law being pushed in Congress right now. I just for, the the Republicans are just very aggressively like anti freedom right now. Um, the free speech stuff is just something they, they scream about because they want like a, a more optics friendly way of defending the indefensibly far right people who support them, you know, like the Steve Bannon type stuff, you know, like Alex Jones, Alex Jones just touts Nazism on his, on his channel, you know, and then Alex Jones gets within the, 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 the bounds of the law you know, sued for uh, defamation in a, in a fashion which I think is, is very okay, very morally fine. Um, and then all of a sudden the right is like, yeah, the free speech of Alex Jones is being targeted. Well, how? I mean, he, he, he has a First Amendment right to say stuff, but he's also, susep you know, susceptible to libel and defamation laws. They don't really care about free speech. They just care about having excuses to defend the people who promote the values they care about. I mean, I definitely think you're more aware of the Alex Jones situation than I am because I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. But my understanding is that he was sued for defamation for the Sandy Hook situation where he said the shooting wasn't real, right? Yeah, along with uh, quite a lot there, yeah. Yeah. So, in my opinion, that would fall under freedom of speech. Defamation and libel are laws that we have. 
He didn't just sure. say it. We're talking about like a targeted multi years long effort to profit off of lying about knowingly lying about people, which is defamation. Okay. I, yeah, I mean, I'm not. Once again, I'm not too familiar with the Alex Jones situation. It got pretty bad. But that that sounds right. Yeah, I mean, it's Alex Jones, so I'm not going to doubt how crazy he got. Uh, I have no doubt that he went completely off the wagon on that. But another form. Okay, uh, do you equate? And this is a genuine question. I'm not trying to make a point here. Do you equate a larger amount of government spending with like, you know, sort of big government authoritarianism. Is that something that would equate in your head? No, I'm totally fine with government spending. Really it depends on what it's spent on. Okay. Like government spending on like Medicare and schools, or sorry, like a uh, medical aid in schools is a good thing. Um, and it ties pretty well to anti-authoritarian political values, right? Uh, whereas countries that spend a lot of their tax dollars on police, military, um, you know, stuff like that, that tends to be more disagreeable to me. Okay, yeah. I think that's fair. I, I guess I'm also against, in that sense, then, yes, authoritarianism, but also just the expansion of government and the expansion of government's role in the everyday person's life. Well, what, what do you mean by that, exactly? I mean, because more spending right, on... Because right now, I bet you those teachers in Florida are experiencing more government intervention than they've ever seen in their entire lives, right? I mean, they're also state employees being hired by the state to teach, you know, teach children. But... Yeah, and then they get the news that they might be charged with a class three felony because one of the books in their classroom uh, has a character in it who's gay. <laughs> so they're... They are now very, uh, very rapidly becoming familiar with the uh, apparatus of state power that they exist within. Yeah, I mean, I already, we, yeah, we talked about that. I no, think that I, that's I know. I just, I think your values. I think your values, and I have a feeling we're going to agree a lot on values and less on like outcomes. But my, my long term here is I'm trying to make you a socialist. That's my, that's my <laughs> long term grooming schedule here. Okay, that's my indoctrination oh, plan. So let's work through it. What do you what do you dislike about uh, expansion of the state? I dislike. Uh, all right, let me try to use different words than just the encouragement. What I just said, I dislike the state having a greater role in every single person's life, regardless of whether or not they agree with what the state is doing. In the sense of, oh, okay, I have to I have to give examples because I'm thinking of examples as I say this. Let's talk about you know, Medicare for all, which is a actually fairly popular policy that a lot of, you know, the Democratic Party has pushed significantly. That's more involvement in the person's life, whether, I mean, I understand that you and your entire chat think that that's objectively for the good. I think that it's going to be probably most likely an expensive disaster, but that's an example. Any sort of government increase in welfare spending, that's probably, that will lead to more dependence on the government and less self, you know, self-dependence, I suppose, would be one way to put it. Well, let's, let's hit it one at a time, if we could. Yeah, I know. So Absolutely. the point of Medicare for All is that right now, a lot of people just can't afford to pay their medical bills or get treatments that they need, necessary life-saving treatments. So in this case, if government involvement is, is life-saving, this seems pretty defensible from my perspective, right? Like if, if, if the involvement of the government is like, yeah, they're involved, congratulations, you know, you don't die of diabetes now. Um, that seems like a pretty, you know, good foot to start on, right? I think there's ways that you can provide, I mean, we have ways actually, we have, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, but I think there's ways that you can provide life-saving treatment to people without establishing a universal system. Well, sure, you can, but, you know, ideally any system you construct that can help people would help the greatest number of people. Uh, I don't see any point in helping less people for no reason, right? If Medicare for all is following the same basic logic of Medicare, you know, if the government involvement is good, why not, right? Well, that's sort of like a, it is a welfare program that, helps people who cannot afford their own, you know, health care or health treatment get health care, which is a good incentive. But when you're looking at the majority of the population who can't afford health care, 
that's a sort of different situation because then you end up, I mean, these health healthcare plans are all different. They all cover different things. And then you put everyone on one plan that's run by the government. I don't consider that good. And I would apply that same principle to all sorts of different welfare government expansion. By the way, I am against the extremely high military spending. I think that should be reduced. Just all of that sort of increase in government presence, which is, of course, then coupled with tax increases and a decrease in the free market. Right. I think that so, ultimately harms people. Okay. So the problem is right now, America has basically the worst medical system in the Western world. Uh, we have a worse medical system dollar per dollar uh, than a lot of non-Western countries. Like it's actually really embarrassing. And when you look at it and you try to understand why it is, it seems like private corporations involvement are hugely responsible for the, um, for the exact ways in which uh, our system is so inefficient. Um, you know, you say that most Americans can afford their health care, but honest to God, not really. Um, employment and health care are tied together for most people in the United States. I can afford independent health care because I'm a successful YouTuber, but for a lot of people, getting fired means losing the ability to gain access to their doctor's visits and medications without bankrupting themselves, which seems like a pretty bad system. In fact, pretty much all info we have on the... Um, uh, popularity of our medical system indicates that people just aren't like happy with it. We just need a good solution. You know, how do you fix this? And I think a very strong case can be made for more government involvement as a way of fixing these issues. Because if, you know, private investment are a huge cause of these problems, why not target that? Well, it's, well what you get then is a one size fits all system yep. that's run by the government. Where a everyone one size fits all system doesn't work. Well, a system where everyone. That's gets the same insurance why does that not work it's well, decommodified you wouldn't pay. need different people need different insurance plans like okay let's give up let's think of i'll think of an example here um you know herbal medicines that what's i mean you already said you're an empiricist let's face the reality don't work certain healthcare plans out there right now will help people pay for those and certain ones won't and the people that need that, want that, can sign up for more expensive health care plans that cover that sort of thing. And people who don't, don't need to. But if we had one Medicare for all system and the people who decided what is and isn't covered wouldn't include fake herbal medicines, uh, then that would just mean that if you want fake herbal medicines, you can buy it without insurance. You can buy it on your own. Uh, that might cost more, but I think people selling fake medicine will understand the fact that they're now operating within a changed market because the government is subsidizing the cost of healthcare. For real healthcare, for actual healthcare, right? Like, you know, the stuff that actually helps people. Um, it, it seems like a slam dunk, no? That assumes that... Uh, well, that assumes that everyone who is involved in the healthcare plan has the exact same values. Okay, sorry, the reason I slowed down there is because I actually just realized the difference in our arguments about this, and it once again goes down to empiricism, actually. I, okay, I'll oh, no. make my point that I now have disagree with. Um, <laughs> uh, I was going, you know, people disagree on what constitutes actual health care. Because, you know, people believe in herbal medicines, and they will be mad that the government will cover the herbal medicines and then they'll petition the government and they'll try to have a bill passed where the universal health care covers herbal medicine. Now, uh, that would be, you know, that sort of situation. I don't really think that's likely to happen. I mean, we have other medical systems in other countries and it really seems like the technocratic approach here is, is kind of necessary, you know? You, you just, you let the doctors decide, which they, they should because your average citizen doesn't know shit about medicine. Um, and it seems like a pretty bad reason to let tens of millions of people wallow with a system they're unhappy with because, uh, you know, like maybe some people want things that don't work for them, right? I mean, I mean, you can find an MD that believes in medical, excuse me, that believes in herbal medicine. Sure, but that doesn't have anything to do with the Medicare for all system, right? We're just talking about people's ability to access these resources for free, which I, I defend wholeheartedly. Well, the herbal medicine example, I think, holds some merit, but it's, it's such a minor point within the broader, broader thing that you're mentioning. I'm trying to think of a better example of the one-size-fits-all 
system because when you look at what that creates, you it doesn't end up working for everyone when everyone is under the same healthcare plan. That's why there's so many differences. And that's just well, what I... But the, the systems that we're talking about and we're trying to replace are insurance systems. The only different systems for insurance there are are determined by how much money you have. If you have more money, you go for insurance uh, systems that are you know better. And if you have less, you go for ones that are less. This isn't really a choice. It's just a long-winded reflection of your socioeconomic status, right? Um, we all have the same bodies and we all, you know, have want to have general doctors and, uh, we all want to be recommended to outpatient stuff. If we need a specialist to look at something or, you know, the process works the same for pretty much everyone, no matter the circumstances, it seems like being able to do all that for free, or at least, you know, not paying for it up front, um, would benefit a lot of people. It would definitely benefit a lot of people, but I don't think it would benefit the people that are looking for things that aren't covered by a government health plan. Well, those, if things aren't covered by it and those things are fake medicine, then I don't care. I'm not, I'm not going to give hundreds of millions of Americans worse health care that costs them more because some people want to have a health plan that covers herbal medicine, which is not something I've ever heard of, by the way. Okay, well, I've definitely heard of that because they exist, but... Regardless, I, I guess. No, I've heard of herbal other... medicine. I've never heard yeah. of a health insurance program that has like an additional provision for um for for like non non medically verified uh um medical procedures. You know what I mean? I've never heard of that. All right, that's yeah. I, I think they do exist, but I'll m move on. And I, I think yeah, you're right about that because I. Can't think. I mean, yeah. The good. Let's assume that my even if my point about the various healthcare plan is true, I think the good that you're mentioning would outweigh that. Actually, so yeah, I'm willing to. Yeah, the good would outweigh it. And the other issue that I've had heard heard about having, <laughs> I, I'm struggling with how to approach this anymore because I'm doubting a lot of things. But well, we're having a good conversation. You, you know, I appreciate it either way. When you were look at these countries that do have universal healthcare systems. I spent a little bit of time living in France and I saw it there. And you can look at the Canadian system, which I've never experienced, but I've read about. They're not perfect systems. You know, you have to wait a long time to see specialists. You can't get necessarily healthcare all the time. Doctors aren't paid well. The medical profession isn't quite as strong there. There's, yeah, well, I guess I'm just asking, what would you say to those sort of issues where, you know, governments, a bureaucracy, bureaucracies are inefficient. It doesn't work out perfectly in these countries that have tried it. Well, I'd agree, really. Um, there is a real issue there. Uh, it's just that oftentimes we forget that these issues exist over here as well. We just don't fully appreciate their scope because over here they're often privatized. You know, like, um, in the in the United States, we have an like mathematically the least efficient healthcare system in terms of proportion between money spent and outcomes. So we're we're in the losing bracket no matter what. But then, honest to God, take a look at the NHS. Fucking sucks. They've been selling yeah. off parts of the NHS to private investors for a long time, and yeah, the doctors are oftentimes underpaid. I can't believe I'm saying that. And yeah, it is kind of choke with bureaucracy. Um, it is uh, not good, though. I think first of all, those aren't. Medicare for all, exactly. Those are usually two-tiered systems, but that's kind of a cop-out answer. The real answer um, to that particular point is more to the effect of um, th the problems that they're facing over there are just a different, um, a different facet of what we're facing over here. They have wait times. We have wait times, but oftentimes we don't appreciate their true length because the biggest wait isn't factored into our calculations. People not being able to afford treatment. People will wait years sometimes before going to the doctor because the wait line here in our you know, paid system is uh, in large part a product of how much you're willing to spend. An ultra wealthy person will never have to wait uh, unless they're waiting on some like incredibly rare bullshit. Um, the, for the most part, they are spared the waiting lines, but other people aren't. And in fact, I'd say America has the worst waiting lines of all. If you factor in people who spend their entire lives not getting their medical issues addressed because they just can't afford to have them addressed, 
Are bureaucracies choked as well? Just it's often private bureaucracy where you have like five administrators for every doctor, you know, that bullshit. Our insurance industry does not help with this problem. So I'm only saying I agree with these issues. I just think there are ways to solve them that involve more intelligent allocation of government resources. I mean, the public, the private bureaucracies that exist, though, have, you know, profit incentives and have the incentive to be efficient. The government bureaucracy has no such incentive, and that's why that system ended up so inefficient and why, as you just said, the British system is so bad. I didn't want to mention the British system because I've done much less research into it. But, but our system is less efficient than theirs, remember? In terms of money spent to medical outcomes, ours is worse by a long shot. So whatever incentive to efficiency the private market is giving our boys, it is worse than what the NHS is doing for them. And that's just because of the cost issue, right? People, you're arguing the wait times are, are equivalent to people not being able to pay for the... Well, I don't actually think that private economies are necessarily efficient, so... Yeah, okay. I'm a little biased in that respect. Uh, the problem with private health care is that medical care is an inelastic good. <clears throat> or service. Um, meaning, of course, that, uh, you know, if a person's dying, they will pay any amount of money to not die. Because they'll pay any amount of money, we don't have the two reciprocal forces that are normally used to dictate responsible pricing in a market. You know, you have like a, a, a like tin of salt that you want to sell, um, and the corporation wants to get as much money as they can, but the, uh, the, the spender wants to spend as little money as possible. So you try to arrive at some kind of buy-sell equilibrium. It doesn't work with healthcare. Uh, it doesn't work with uh, a lot of stuff, housing either, because people need these things. So they're never going to be able to walk away if the price is too high. They get it or they don't. Well, there's still, as is with any business in capital, or any industry rather in capitalism, there's still competition between different doctors. I mean, you say that the doctor can hike up the price to a million dollars and people will still try to find a way to pay it. That's only true if there's not another doctor willing to do it for less money. Do you, have you ever gone shopping for a doctor? Do you see if they post their prices for their procedures online? I, I mean, you certainly can compare options if you nope. call, put the effort in to do so. Call their receptionist. How much would it cost for me to get X procedure? Well, it depends on your insurance. And then you tell them your insurance, but they won't tell you. You can't compare prices because the system is designed in such a way to completely obfuscate the, um, the available visible prices of these services. Well, I will admit I've not tried to shop around with medical procedures, so I don't know, you know anecdotally if that's the case. But if that's the case, that certainly is an issue. Now, is. let's say that that issue was fixed and doctors could compete in prices mm -hmm. which i don't know if that's the case or not but well, if, if that were if doctors could compete in prices if it worked like anything else under the capitalist marketplace would that allow for the fair competition and the reduced prices well the next issue that you would run into and we're going to run into a few but i think they can all be resolved um the next issue that we would run into here um is the insurance companies See, the price that you get charged not only is invisible, but is also charged factoring in um, the expected costs uh, uh, of your insurance and how much they'll cover for you. The amount you'll get charged for a procedure can change day to day, week to week, and it can change depending on whether or not you have insurance. Sometimes having insurance is actually more expensive than not. Like, you could pay a hundred up front, or they'll charge your insurance company a thousand if you have one, and you end up paying twenty percent of that, which is two hundred. So there's an entire like behind the scenes, like mirror and smoke screens act gambit going on to make it really difficult to to to, to be able to fix or address any of this. But even if you could fix all of that, at the end of the day, you're still paying for something that your life depends on. Um, uh, you know, appendicitis can kill an append or sorry, not, um, not an appendectomy. Um, when, when they, uh, when they remove your appendix, um, that's not an appendectomy. Uh, appendicitis is the one I know as well. Don't worry about it. Sorry. I think an appendectomy is when they do that thing in your neck, they cut, they put a hole in your neck. No, it is I appendectomy or right. Wait, then wait. Sorry. I'm looking at chat. Wait, then what's yeah. the term for when you got a hole in your, in your throat? 
when when they do the thing you can't breathe tracheectomy okay okay sorry i got that um uh an appendectomy isn't like an optional thing you can get or not get right i mean it's kind of necessary if you don't want to die so um they still have a an advantage over you in terms of their pricing that isn't the case for regular commodities i think uh, this is an unresolvable problem under capitalism. Uh, even people like Adam Smith said so with regards to um, uh, uh, land value, of course, because land is a finite commodity and everyone needs it, or at least needs a home to sleep under. Um, it, it, we see these problems replicate themselves in a lot of inelastic goods. Okay, yeah. As, it, as in, you know, you go in, you need the surgery, you're going to get the surgery at the first hospital you show up to, regardless of whether the cost is high or not. Yeah, and, and, that, and that usually you don't even have a choice as well. And, and you know, if they, they might hide it from you. You can see some emergency room bills in U.S. hospitals that rake up to the tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars based on what seems to be like magical funny money math being done in the background that has no relationship whatsoever with like the actual value of anything, you know? Oh, yeah, that, that definitely needs to be fixed. I mean, there's no debating that the current healthcare system needs reforms there and i think we can all get behind that honestly yeah. so I, we are talking right now we are talking right now about stuff that is explicitly incentivized oh, under yeah. a privatized system after all none of this would be an issue if things were decommodified because the hospital you go to isn't going to get any more money whether or not they fleece you they can't fleece you you're not charged anything yeah, i guess it's just an issue of if the government bureaucracy is worth that cost or not because the, the, yeah, the wait times to see the specialists and all that doesn't play into an efficient system. And I guess the way to fix that under the government would be to just pump more money into it. Well, yeah, I'm, getting I'm rid of the uh, insurance agencies as well. That's like a ton of money just getting wasted off the top right there, you know? Sure, yeah. Well, how, well, how would you say to that, you know? We're, we're talking magic here, okay. Not immediately practical or possible, but let's talk magic. Um, sure. let's right. say that we do Medicare for all. And what that entails in this specific instance is we snap our fingers, we get rid of all insurance companies because we, we don't need them anymore. Um, we keep all existing hospitals, all existing clinics, pri private care, whatever else. And the rules this, okay, here's the salary you get. If you're a doctor, a nurse, whatever, here is your salary. All right. You are no longer running a business. This is the government's business now. You just keep doing what you were doing. You know, you're doing the hospital life-saving bit, all right? We're doing the uh, admin bit. They all get their salaries. Um, and, this, you know, the, the stipulation then is that if anyone comes in and needs any kind of medical help, they just get it for free. Um, there's no charging being done at the door. They walk in there, uh, they book an appointment, or they get one right then, depending on the need. Uh, if that could be done, do you think that'd be a fine system? If the system worked perfectly, the government bureaucracy didn't cause issues, then I would say that would be a fine system, yes. All right. Well, that's nice. I think it's a fine system, too. You know, uh, as it's functioning right now in my head, I'm rotating it uh, like a 3D object right up there. Um, nothing works perfectly, of course, but ideally, uh, you could get something working better than our current system, which is, of course, you know, the... Uh, you know, the, the real standard for improvement that we should be focusing on. Yeah, I think we can... How much work do you think can be done in improving the private system, though? Because I think you could, just like you pictured the perfect picturesque model for a public system, you could do the same thing for a private, private system. Like, we're talking magic now. So, you know, the issues are gone with hospitals like you know ridiculously overcharging the issues are gone with you know people well okay with yeah with the medical industry being a you know scam for pharmaceutical companies and insurance companies and all that except it's still done privately where doctors run businesses and you know there's still capitalistic incentives to do a good job and not just the government bureaucracy running the entire thing would you say that would be a fine system? My argument would be that the problems that we've been discussing are intrinsic to uh, a private model for healthcare because the, um, the profit motive does not itself contain an incentive 
for these good behaviors we're discussing uh, when it comes to inelastic demand. Um, you know, even I, a socialist, am willing to acknowledge some positive incentives in most commodities, but for this one, I don't believe it exists. Whereas I do think there's a positive incentive when it comes to public regulation of healthcare, which is to say uh, PR and voting for politicians. In that case, you do have a moat of accountability to the broader system, and they have one to you. Uh, I just don't think that's really the case with um, uh, with uh, uh, any kind of private control. Okay, so that would be a fine system, but that system isn't possible because it's inherent to capitalism. When it comes to healthcare, yes. I think we're running up against like the limit. Um, you know, I, I'm not even like a radically uh, for the abolition of private markets as a lot of my contemporaries, uh, even under socialism, the idea of like um, commodified markets for luxury goods, you know, stuff that's totally not at all necessary to life. I, I, I guess I can, you know, I, I, I can see how these things, you know, um, could be maybe not only desirable, but maybe unavoidable. But um, healthcare is the opposite of a luxury good, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think the I, I appreciate that you acknowledge that those sort of incentives can be good within some markets, but I would say they're even good within, you know, for example, the food market. You know, food is obviously not a luxury good; it's an essential good. But having a private industry around food, with reasonable regulations, of course, allows for consumer choice and allows for, you know, the businesses to be held accountable by the public rather than a government bureaucracy running it. I mean, would you, would you, in your ideal world, as a socialist, privatize food? Excuse, like, excuse me. Well, what Socialize? would you do with food? Socialized food, that's what I meant, yes. Of course. Um, yes. I, yes, uh, overwhelmingly so. Uh, I don't that's think... That's what I imagine. I don't think that the... Um, I don't think that private control does as much to food as it does to healthcare, but there are still critical issues. Um, things are alleviated somewhat by the fact that food is... Uh, sort of omnipresently necessary, which makes it a very transparent commodity to observe price fluctuations in. So it like humans need food all the time, constantly day in, day out. So we have systems to provide food to people everywhere all the time. Um, and I do think that does a lot to kind of, I don't know, throw it into public scrutiny, give it a little bit more, um, more, more heft when it comes to whether or not people are critical of what seem to be arbitrary price changes, but we do still see issues. Right now, for example, um, it seems like a lot of the inflation crisis that, we, uh, that we've seen with prices in our grocery stores going up really, really quickly, a lot of that seems to have been made up, um, where uh, food companies being one of the biggest perpetuators of this, they just raised their prices, you know? Like you have all of these corporations who are posting record profits in their, you know, quarter one reports. And meanwhile, the cost of the commodities they sell are going up everywhere, not just at any given location. The only, I, I think the only conclusion you can derive from this is that they just chose to raise the prices because they could. But it's not as though, you know, we're, we're living in some kind of like uh, utopian society, totally free of poverty. You know, people need that food to be cheap. People are really struggling right now, and I don't think the market really provides a solution to this. Well, I would disagree with the premise that it's just a bunch of food companies deciding to raise prices. Um, the supply and demand, if one company were to then, I, I mean, this is, you know, I'm sure you've heard this one before, it's kind of the fundamentals of a capitalist economic course. I mean, if one company would undercut the other other company and sell the food for cheaper, they would then be the one that gets all of the business and i the but it often that doesn't the work that way market, right what'd you say sorry it often doesn't work that way does it though right well i think it does i think that's the logical way that it would work well that's the logical way that it would work but here's an example of price undercutting not going the right way forever you know uber uh ubers used to be really cheap now they're not they're crazy expensive Turns out they deliberately cut their prices so they could uh, knock taxis out of business, make sure everyone got used to using Uber. And now a 15 minute Uber to my downtown is like $43. Um, so sometimes, you know, the price competition is just a way of securing an economic advantage for as long as necessary 
to really, you know, twist the knife in. Uh, additionally, uh, you know, the idea that prices will always be driven down to their lowest margin is kind of ridiculous because corporations also seek to skim as much profit as possible off the top. What's to keep corporations from colluding and just establishing a baseline for their prices, uh, which is elevated massively above what they need to sell it at, and then just sit easy knowing that nobody is going to be able to live without the food they provide? And I would say competition fundamentally is what prevents that. And with the example you gave with Uber, I mean, that's a classic, classic example of what has increasingly become a monopoly. I mean, when you are but looking for default. a ride, that's... Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, when you're looking for a ride, that's where people go, because they to put taxes out of business. And the solution there would be, you know, monopolies are bad, which is something you would struggle to find a capitalist these days that disagrees with. But monopolies are inevitable. I don't think that's. I don't think that's necessarily the case because monopolies haven't happened in most industries, and when they have happened, there has been solutions to that because but eventually they're undercut. They actually have. Um, this is one of the reasons why trust busting was such a big issue and why it's kind of failed. We now have like six companies that own everything, like everything basically. We used to have more banks than we do now. Now it's like, I don't know what, five of them? Um, basically all of our media comes from Disney. Uh, basically all of our social media comes from a couple of billionaire magnates who have almost complete control over the algorithms that decide uh, and set in motion almost every political trend we see in our country. Um, if you, we also have like local monopolies. Depending on where you live, there might be only one private company that runs transit in your area, one private company that runs your garbage, one private company that provides power. Thanks, PG&E, for my time in Northern California. I fucking hate you. Um, monopolies are everywhere all the time. Uh, internet companies uh, are like a long-standing example of this. You know, like sometimes in an area you're in, you have literally one choice for an ISP. If they suck, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, kill yourself. I <laughs> guess you, that's always an option. Um, not much else you can do, really. Uh, monopolies are the natural state of the market. Government intervention seeks to break them up sometimes. Like that time uh, Bill Gates uh, provided money to Apple to prevent Microsoft from being a computer monopoly. Like he pumped up the opposition. But for the most part, um, I, I really do think that's the natural state of things. Yeah, I, I think competition fundamentally drives against that. Because as you mentioned, there's a few social media companies that dominate most of it, but I would they're not all interconnected. They're in direct competition with each other to get more of a client base. But that's still and a monopoly, also, right? Like there are other options for people out there. If you don't like Instagram because you don't like the Zuck, you can find alternatives that are not, you know, run by that company. Like and what? That's fundamentally not a monopoly. Well like what? You can, I mean, Instagram and Facebook are the two run by Mark Zuckerberg, right? I mean, that's not all of social media. Okay, but when we say, like, monopolies, what we're talking about right now is the entire Western English-speaking world on three websites. It's literally, like, it's like Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, uh, uh, TikTok. Um, okay, I, I maybe Reddit, you know? So, like, I would consider this a monopoly. Reddit, you could call some YouTube social media. A, you, a you YouTube, could. YouTube. Okay, so it's like, rather than one billionaire, it's like four. Uh, uh, which haven't been challenged, by the way, because um, there's nothing you can actually do to challenge it. Like, they create gab and, you know, vote or whatever else, but they fall apart because at the end of the day, you can't, like, the idea that you can just break some towering uh, uh like uber powerful uh socially normalized system just by creating an alternative uh it just doesn't work right i think the reason that those are the four that almost everyone uses and the ones that we know about is because those are the ones that consumers choose to use if, if everyone wanted to switch over to gab tomorrow everyone could but that's like yeah but this is how monopolies function right like 
Microsoft was a monopoly back in the 1990s, but everyone could have gone out and create and like bought an Apple, but they don't because that's not that's not how the economy works. Like this is one of those econ 101 things where it's like, okay, well, technically you can create an opposition or, or technically you can move over, but that doesn't actually happen. In reality, once you have the power, you keep the power like pretty much always. There are very few examples historically of institutions that are very powerful, that have a lot of money and wealth and so on, um, not just maintaining it. Look at Ford. Ford is one of the oldest U.S. car companies, and it sucks. Ford cars have been a laughing stock for decades, uh, even with competition from, um, from foreign markets. Uh, Ford maintains one of the largest like U.S. automobile production shares, seemingly despite its inferiority, to other car brands because it's Ford. Because they had the power. They were so powerful, they got bailed out. You know, like, it's, what can you do about it, huh? I mean, I think, I don't know. Is Ford that bad? I think Ford's an example of... I don't like them. Um, you don't like them? Okay, fair enough. I think that if consumer, I just think fundamentally, if consumers really didn't like Ford, I think the car market is actually a very competitive market. And if you want, an, you know, if, if everyone hated Ford and no one wanted a Ford car, no one would buy a Ford car, especially when you go into the car market, that's a market where people aren't making their decisions lightly. It's not like someone's, you know, buying a $5 collectible somewhere that they don't look at the company that made it. They don't do any research. I mean, this is a car. They do quite a bit of research into whether it's good, the company behind it. If people didn't like Ford, they wouldn't buy from Ford. Well, then why do people constantly buy cars with subpar safety ratings instead of just getting like a like a super reliable Hyundai or or, or like Toyota or something? Like wh why like bad car brands with bad ratings get a lot of sales usually because of brand name uh, recognition, um, and and that's not really like an efficient market process, right? I mean, the whole concept of advertisement itself breaks with the idea of people making efficient decisions when it comes to consumer consumption. Advertising, it doesn't like, like advertising, the whole point is to like convince a person to make a decision they wouldn't have made otherwise, right? It's not a, like a, a, a rational environment. Um, it, all you have to do if you're a powerful corporation and you want to stay in charge is just have a share in the uh, local media. Just uh, buy out ads, and hey, if there's anyone critical of you, maybe just you know indicate you kind of don't want that airing. And what are they going to do? I mean, I'd say the purpose of ads is more to, you know, get sales by telling people the product exists rather to than to enforce against competition, especially in the car market. Because, but the point of I competition don't know, is maybe in, this isn't. Sorry, the you know. point of competition is informed decision making, right? But advertising doesn't yeah. rely on that. Nobody puts out an ad saying, yeah, our product kind of sucks, TBH, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's up to the consumer at that point to determine whether or not the product being advertised is worth buying. But I mean, people make irrational buying decisions all the time. And what happens if they just buy out your local media, right? I mean, like Amazon uh, is controlled by Bezos. Bezos uh, controls the Washington Post. What if Bezos spent a little bit oh, yeah, more money I, and... It, no, I just said I hated that. Go ahead. That was a side comment. Oh, yeah. Well, Bezos. what if he just, you know, bought up some more media um, and just, you know, never had any information negative to Amazon published and only published good info about Amazon? And he just kept doing that until you couldn't get any negative word out about Amazon anywhere. I mean, I just don't think that's feasible. I don't think you can prevent everywhere and every well every media outlet every social media outlet everywhere from posting negative things about amazon i mean that's like dystopian reality it's happened before. i mean that would be the equivalent of me taking a like the worst case of a socialist country and saying like oh but what if the you know government you know the president of a socialist country says no more food like i feel like that's the equivalent but you should because the thing that you would criticize in those socialist countries is not socialism but authoritarianism and that's exactly what i'm doing too just from the corporate angle. What I'm talking about right now, corporate monopolies, controlling the media, this has happened before. Um, we saw a pretty clear example of the government getting involved in this back during the buildup towards the invasion of Iraq back in 2003. Because at the time, I swear to God, you could not have put a gun to the head of any of those TV anchors 
um, and told them, say something discouraging about the war effort or I'll pull the trigger. They, they all would have taken the bullet. They all fell in line. A whole bunch of institutionalized, uh, you know, media personalities, they all towed the, well, not party line, I guess, the national line um, on the need for war. Uh, when it comes to, like, corporate control, though, like, you don't have to control everything. If you run Amazon and you control about 50% of the media in this country, that is enough that you can maintain power basically forever, right? I mean, like, you don't need every single American to to use Amazon. You just need enough of them that you can maintain the power you already have. Yeah, I mean, so long as competent, like, okay. Let's say that, okay, we're imagining, okay, Bezos controls 50% of the media. Amazon does something, you know, Amazon kills a thousand children. What about Coca-Cola funding about death that? squads in Latin America? Yeah, I'm just not familiar with this. Um, I, I wonder know, like, why. I've heard that. Okay, okay, you know what? Fair enough. That's a fair point. Um, what about everything Nestle's done in Africa? I have heard of that one. Well, well um, it ha hasn't hurt their market share. I'll tell you that much. That's that's a fair critique. Yeah. Look, the criticisms that I make here of corporations are the same ones that I would make of what I consider to be state overreach. I just don't think there's any difference between a corporation and a government past a certain size. If you got rid of the government, reduced everything down to some kind of Mad Max, anarcho-capitalist, libertarian hellhole, Eventually, one of those corporations, one of those private free enterprises of consenting individuals who sign contracts to their employment, you know, they would get big enough and they would say, hey, this here's my property. Don't step on it without following these rules. And then the boundary of that property would grow out far enough that they would have a territorial stake equivalent to that of, I don't know, Montana. And then you might as well just have a state. Uh, they'd have their own uh, courts and their own, um, well, they'd have their own everything. It'd, it'd be a state. Um, it just wouldn't get called one. A state, a state is just the biggest corporation in an area. I think um, it, 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 the power systems just merge between each other depending on what their need is. They're very amorphous in that sense, kind of like the same way that back in the old West days when we were manifest destining over to the Pacific Coast, uh, corporations that made a stake out there kind of operated like their own governments. For instance, the railroad corporations. Um, were given by the government all land within a quarter mile of any track they could lay in between the east and west coasts. Which meant that, I mean, they could set up their own towns, company towns. And in a lot of areas for a long time, um, the local railroad was essentially your government. I mean, they had enforcers, it was their land, and the nearest actual representative of the U.S. government could have been dozens or even hundreds of miles away. And you don't even know where they are. It's the old West days. Like, what are you going to do? Um, anyway, anyway, it's just a fundamental critique of power is all I'm saying. I just think okay. that it can take a lot of forms. Well, I'll agree with you on the fundamental critique of power. But the difference that I see between power held by the government and power held by corporations is that the government will, in a liberal democracy where corporations are regulated, the government will always be able to do things that a company, a corporation cannot do. I don't think that in a liberal democracy we're ever going to live in a society where the, you know, corporations can put people in prison for their entire lives or to take it to an extreme, you know, carry out executions. Meanwhile, we live in a country where the government does carry out executions, which, by the way, I'm against. I get but, that. But, but if I may, we do have yeah. private prisons owned by corporations, and those corporate private prisons do directly pay and lobby for uh, local police departments to arrest more people so they can get more prisoners to use for slave labor to sell off to other corporations. So that's probably not good. I mean, yeah, I'd say private prisons aren't good, but that doesn't change the fact that the government will always be able to do things that the state can do. Well, someone will always be able to do something, to be sure. But if you get rid of the state's power to do certain things, I think you open the door for corporations to then do those things themselves, which is one of the reasons why I'm such a big fan of regulation. It's not just a matter of whether or not the government has that power, you know. It's a matter of whether or not uh, the corporations would take that power in the absence of the government being able to exercise it. Um, 
you know, like uh, SEC regulations. Oh. Uh, you can regulate the market yeah, or the market can least. tell you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why I think the perfect mix, going right off your point, I agree with that, is a mix between, you know, corporations and the government coexisting, where corporations are limited by the regulations of the government, the reason regulations, the government. And, you know, if, if you replace, if you end up replacing those corporations with the government, you know, in the form of socialism, what you end up with is the government, which, as we have discussed, is an inefficient bureaucracy holding all of the power. True, but understand that there's a difference between government-owned and government-controlled. See, this is one of the reasons why, when I say decommodification, I don't always mean government-controlled. I'm in favor of worker cooperatives. If you had worker cooperatives, you could get rid of the private incentive uh, for uh, capital accumulation while still having... Um, you know, uh, the, the, the autonomy and robustness of, uh, of an individual economic unit. Um, so if you had a system like that, I think you could avoid turning over too much power to the government, which I would, of course, you know, I, I would also like to avoid if possible. Um, I think the government is certainly capable of doing many bad things, but sometimes power given to the government actually ends up uh, empowering the citizenry. Uh, reciprocally, right? So, for example, when Nixon created the Environmental Protection Agency and the government suddenly had the power to enforce environmental regulations in a way they didn't before, that was giving the government power, but that then, additionally, uh, allowed your average American citizen to enjoy much cleaner air and water and, 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 and soil, right? Which I think is a kind of freedom, the freedom to enjoy the public commons untainted. Uh, and that was a product of government power, just used responsibly. Yeah, and that's why that's an example of when the government can be helpful. I'm certainly not arguing the government can't be helpful. I mean, it's somewhat ironic that Nixon made the EPI. I've been familiar with that in the past, but I've talked about why that's ironic. But He's done a lot of wild things. He has, yeah. He was he was crazy. He was, in, in a mixed good and bad way, he was a crazy president. Um, regardless, I, I still think that Oh, well, first of all, you mentioned worker, co worker cooperatives. I'm absolutely a fan of that. I think that if most corporations could become worker cooperatives, that would ultimately be a good thing for society. Well, I think... is, that what you, is that what you mean when you say socialism, worker cooperatives, or are you saying government? Um, well, I think the government certainly has a role to play, but I mostly mean worker cooperatives. Um, the, the failure of previous socialist states, I think, has been the conflation of public support and government support. So socialism is a decommodified economy, um, which is which is controlled by the people, and you you've abolished uh, it's it's publicly controlled, and you have uh, you've abolished the um, uh, private commodity uh, production, and um, the issue is that oftentimes you know they abolish private commodity production, uh, but then rather than having things controlled by the people, they have things controlled by the government, uh, with the the assumption that the government represents the people, and therefore is a appropriate proxy for their interests, which I think is horseshit. Um, they, they, you know, this problem gets run into time after time after time. Uh, very frustrating, you know. God willing, one day, uh, we'll, uh, we'll do it proper. That's interesting. So, uh, I've never heard that... Uh, okay, socialism, by the, every definition I've heard from right-wing people, left-wing people, socialists themselves, has involved the government-running industry. If it was universally worker cooperatives, I don't see, I mean, that's not what I've, I've never heard socialism be defined that way. But if, if socialism is just companies that still have a profit incentive, because, you know, the profit incentive will then just go to the owners of the worker cooperative, which is the workers. If that's, I mean, that's still a private free market system, essentially. Well, you would decommodify it. So ideally, past a point, you would have no market. I think the first thing that you have to focus on is the worker cooperatives themselves, because it's very difficult to decommodify an entire economy. You start system by system. Healthcare is a good starting one. So is um, uh, uh, housing. Uh, you want to decommodify that. And that means government control, at least for now. Uh, the worker cooperatives and housing cooperatives are both a thing. So, you know, it's, it's government possible. Government controlling of housing scares me, but go ahead. Uh, sure, right. Well, I'm on the streets. Um, but I agree that uh, the government has done a poor job with housing as it stands. One of the large issues, of course, is that uh, when it comes to zoning decisions, these are made by city councils or at least at a local level pretty often. And that means that the people making these decisions are all boomers 
in their 80s who bought a property on the West Coast sometime in the late 60s, uh, which cost them like one blowjob and three cents. And they're, uh, they're currently sitting on like $10 million of property, and they really, really do not want to lower their property values by build, uh, building new housing. So it, it's, <laughs> it's a whole thing. Um, but it can be addressed, I think. It, it can be improved. Um, you work with stuff like that, and I think you try to promote economic democracy in, in private corporations. You know, like the idea that um, uh, you, you should be pushing for either partial or total worker cooperative assimilation. And then if you do that for long enough, I think eventually you have a kind of a template to get rid of private commodity production entirely. And that would be my hope. You know, it's, it's a dream. Sure, sure. And I'm with you to the point of worker cooperatives, because I mean, I am, I'm a capitalist. I don't think worker cooperatives are contrary to capitalism in the slightest, uh, which, I mean, they exist, so they're not. We have a capitalist system and worker cooperatives exist. And I think that if majority of corporations became worker cooperatives, that'd be great. Why move on to decommodifying, removing the profit incentive for those worker cooperatives to be efficient? Well, for things like healthcare and housing, I think it's necessary because you're working with those inelastic demands, uh, just an innate flaw in, in private capital um, accumulation. Uh, it just doesn't account for stuff like that. You know, and, th and those critiques go back, I mean, all the way back to the, uh, the Enlightenment. So that's not, that's not just a socialist thing. But um, moreover, for bro like broader decommodification, it's mostly because I fucking hate the bourgeoisie. Um, the, the abolition of the economic class of the bourgeoisie is necessary under any socialist vision, not purely for economic gain, but for political gain. Uh, you know, as it stands right now with simple Marxist analysis indicates that people tend to act in ways that serve the interests of their class constituency. That is to say, you know, poor people, white people, black people, rich people, uh, we're all given different hands in life and we tend to act in ways that, uh, benefit us as much as possible within that framework. The issue, of course, is that the bourgeois, by you know necessity, because they profit tremendously off the labor of others, have a lot of power, and they have a different set of class interests. Because they have power, they often achieve positions of power, and so a very small minority of people with different interests control society and pulls things away from the rightful proletarian interests of the broader public. Even more sinisterly, these people often control the media as well. I mean, what poor person controls the media, right? Um, which means that uh, they have the ability to manufacture consent of their rule by pulling people over to their way of thinking, getting them to sympathize with their ideology. Uh, I think that this is um, essentially an, an inextricable component of capitalism. I think it, it, there's no way around that it has to be dealt with through the abolition of the bourgeois. The bourgeois, I mean, I'm familiar with, oh, I mean, I'm not that, I mean, I'm, I'm only familiar with the extreme basics of Marxist theory. The bourgeois is just the production owners of any small business. That's not necessarily Jeff Bezos. He'd probably be more in like the landowner category, honestly, but that's the small business owners and the... He's the super bourgeoisie. Small the, business okay. owners are usually referred to as the petite bourgeois. Um, the broad distinction is that a person is bourgeois if ever they make their money off of the labor of others, as opposed to their own labor. So technically okay. owning stock, uh, by the oldest definition, would make one a member of the bourgeoisie, but that's an unworkable definition. So I think like we can more broadly say like a person is bourgeois if they mostly uh, you know, make their living off of the labor of others. Sure. So if socialism is about removing the power of the bourgeoisie under the definition that you defined, which thank you for clarifying that, wouldn't worker cooperatives do that even without decommodification. Worker cooperatives would split the proceeds, uh, the revenue of their work um, between all workers as dictated by whatever democratic vote they decide to do within, because you can of course vote for your leaders in a worker cooperative. Yes. Um, so, so they would have the ability to, to work that out uh, internally, I think. And um, this would mean that while they are all collectively benefiting from their uh, 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 the labor of others because things are split and shared, they are not individually of a different class character to the others. Members of worker cooperatives, even if they all own the business they work in, are traditionally considered to be members of the proletariat 
because even though in a sort of abstracted sense, the worth of the labor is spread about um, in a direct and material sense, you know, they are all working for their labor and therefore they have the same political interest. If everyone worked in such a place, that would mean that everyone broadly, uh, you know, uh, every um, politician, every person who goes on to, uh, uh, you know, run a media company sort of collectively with their workers, they would all be sympathetic to proletarian interests. So I hope it is. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I think you, I mean, I'm with you to, I, yeah, I've said this. I'm Sorry, with I you hardcore rambled there, by the way, I apologize. No, oh, no, I actually really appreciated it. It's, it's very interesting to hear because um, I've only ever heard Marxist theory from a non-Marxist, honestly. So other than watching a couple of your videos, maybe. But. Well, you remember how earlier you talked about the authoritarian socialist countries? Yeah, definitely. So what what we're hitting on here is the issue I have with those. See, Lenin wrote on a vanguard party the idea that in, under revolutionary conditions you couldn't really expect the proletariat because especially back then, you know, the proletariat in Russia in like 1917 were uh, illiterate, politically uneducated. It was difficult for him to imagine them being effective advocates for their political interest. So uh, he suggested the formation and use of a vanguard party. Uh, and their basic responsibility would be to be like a specific group of political elites who would represent the interests of their constituency, of the, um, of the proletariat. And this is the critical issue, right? Once you create a vanguard party, you've created a group of people with a different distinct set of material interests, which means that even if they initially claim to represent the proletariat, as soon as they achieve power, they are going to be shaped by the different set of interests they have. and eventually they're going to run away from you. Um, and that's the issue I have. And this keeps happening over and over. It happened in China to an extent different there. It happened more directly in, in Vietnam. It happens all over the place, which is why you need direct proletarian control of the state. You can't go through a vanguard party. Okay. Yeah, I, I definitely, yeah, that sounds vastly preferable. It sounds like a good prevention of authoritarianism, definitely. Yeah, well, I mean, you. the Maybe... worker cooperatives, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 I just, I, I appreciate that, you know? I uh, I don't think I'm ever going to uh, engage in any revolutionary Catalonian behavior myself, but uh, God oh, willing, well. uh, one day, a, a, a proper example of this will be sort of effectively carried out. I mean, I, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, go, other than the part where you talked about decommodification, I could see worker cooperatives becoming the prominent form that companies are run. I don't think that's unfeasible. I mean, they're, they're on the rise, obviously vast minority, but I wouldn't, I mean, I think that's the solution to look for. It is to a lot of, yeah. An innately anti-authoritarian one, if nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. I'm big on that. So, yeah. yeah I think I, I just, I don't know that's not really, I mean, is that socialism? I, I don't see that fully as socialism. Well, I'm, I'll slippery slope socialism. you. I'll slippery slope you on that one. You know, we get you, we warm you up with the uh, worker cooperatives and you're like, Oh, you know, this is okay. This is fine. Things are going well. Sneakily behind the scenes, industry after industry oh, gets no. decommodified. And before you know it, you know, that's how we get you. Yeah, well, now I got to be careful. But uh, no, I, I think that's you can have a capitalistic system with worker cooperatives that remains, you know, honestly a bigger profit incentive. And I'll explain my reasoning for saying that. I think that if every single worker is motivated by the profit of their company rather than all of the profit going to a CEO, if every worker of Amazon was making fat stacks instead of just Jeff Bezos, they would actually be more incentivized to make the system run efficiently. Uh, I um, agree with that. There actually so is, I'd say there is research on that. Fair. Yeah. There's actually research on um, people working harder in worker cooperatives because they feel a greater sense of ownership uh, and control over the... Um, over the, the business that they're working at, you know, they, 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 they feel less like, uh, you know, like an exploited, uh, you know, something, something they run in there to get treated like shit for so long. And then they leave for home. They feel more like, um, you know, somebody with an actual investment in, in the place they work at. Yeah. I'm reading your chat right now. I'm oh, not no, a social... terrible uh, mistake. Is... I know, I know, I know. I had to take a look though. I was, uh, yeah, drawn in by the siren song there. Um, no, I, I I don't think that this is socialism in the sense that anyone other than maybe Vash 
is saying it's socialism. Well, a because lot of like, a lot of people disagree with me on this. I'll I'll be forthcoming on that. Okay. Though keep in mind, it's... and and you know this is the slippery slope. This is uh this is where we get you. Um, oh. after you have people in a in a more worker cooperative oriented society thinking, oh wow, you know, um, things went really really well. Uh, after we took our workplaces and we made them democratic and we 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 gave everyone a voice. Um, so why is it that we still have members of the bourgeois? disproportionately represented in uh you know every facet of power in our society i just i, I wonder how how much that would incline people towards a, a broadly socialistic attitude towards um political organizing yeah I, it, chat distracting you, you somewhat lost me there yeah that's unfortunately. okay you know we've been talking for a good <laughs> long time i actually think we this have. would be a pretty good breaking off point I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Um, it was great to talk to you. Um, I mean, worker co-ops are now something I'd solidly support. I hope that comes to fruition. And it's not socialism, because that's not what anyone says socialism is. Of course not. It's okay. not socialism. Think. Okay, okay. I'm going to do more research on this. Yeah. It's It's been a delight to speak with you. I really appreciate it. It's been great to speak with you as well. I've been left with a lot to think about. And I, I actually, did you just end the stream? No, no, I'll be here for a, a moment more as I yell at my chat. Okay, it ended on my screen for some reason. I don't know why. Oh, uh, that's the anti-socialist but... filter. Uh, finally kicked in. Okay. Well, I have one closing thought, but I'll DM that to you after this. But, Feel yeah, free. Thank you. It was absolutely great to talk to you. Um, a lot to think about. And uh, yeah, have a good one. Have a wonderful evening. You too. Oh, well, that was fun. I didn't expect the conversation to uh, to go that way at all. We, hmm, maybe we should do more debates, though. That ended up being more conversational towards the towards the end there. But you know, um, actually went more well. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for for sticking around through it, DM. I I appreciate that. Yeah, no, I I had fun there. Um, that's how you get the positive imaging. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was a it was a, a really friendly combo. You know, I I, I like that. You have the patience of a saint? No, um, no, uh, that didn't take any patience at all, actually. Uh, that guy was, he was not obstinate or hard-headed or stupid at all. I mean, obviously, I, I think, I think some of his positions are, 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 are insane with the, the creationism thing, like, you know, the, uh, yeah, so not, not to speak of disagreements or whatever, but, um, in terms of, like, how he thought about stuff, yeah, I thought, I thought that was a, um, I thought that was a really good convo. Okay, I think, I think, I think I'm also actually about to beat the last character here uh, on the thing. Okay, stop giving me potato throwers. I don't want potato throwers. I want other weapons, please. Please. Oh my, wait, am I going to lose now? Oh my god, wait, am I going to lose here because of this? Okay, that's one actual ranged weapon. Another crossbow. We have room for one more. Dude, a plank? Okay, fuck. This is actually going to be a bit difficult. <laughs> Hold on. Here, wait. Maybe it's not going to be difficult. Maybe I'm, like, underestimating my strength here. Okay, I think I'm underestimating my strength. I think I'm actually pretty strong. Um... Yeah. So yeah, you all enjoyed the conversation. We should we should do email debates more, I think. Have you looked at Vampire Survivors? I have one hundred percent of it. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, that was a good convo. I um. Bosch is micro bourgeoisie or however you spell that. Um, to an extent, yeah. I mean, I do, um, I do profit from... It's kind of complicated when it comes to, like, media stuff, because there is no interchangeability with labor. Like, there's no way for anyone to do what I do, um, apart from myself, which means that it's, you know, they're, they're, the kind of, like, normally presumed ability for other people to fill a role can't be done, because I'm, I'm a media personality, you know. Um, oh boy. Oh boy. 
Hold on, wait. I didn't think that getting so many, like, turrets and mines over the course of this with no engineering would be a good idea, but it actually worked out really well. I wonder how a, like, pure engineering build for the gun... Oh, no. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh! Oh! Oh, my God. Yeah, that's true, Demon Mama. It's difficult. We did it! A random weapon is upgraded when entering a shop. If you have no weapon to upgrade, you gain plus two armor instead. Oh, that's actually really good, I think. Um, guys, look! Gold star.